One of the Rover, Part One, by Afra Ben. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Prologue, written by a person of quality. Wits like physicians never can agree when of a different society, and Ravel's drops were never more cried down by all the learned doctors of the town than a new play whose author is unknown nor can those doctors with more malice sue and powerful purses the dissenting few than those with an insulting pride do rail at all who are not of their own cabal if a young poet hit your humour right you judge him then out of revenge and spite whom monkeys hate for being too like themselves so that the reason of the grand debate, why wit so oft is damned when good plays take, is that you censure as you love or hate. Thus, like a learned conclave, poets sit Catholic judges of both sense and wit, and damn or save as they themselves think fit. Yet those who to others' faults are so severe are not so perfect but themselves may err, some right correct indeed but then the whole batting their own dull stuff in the play is stole as bees do suck from flowers their honey dew so they rob others striving to please you some write their characters genteel and fine but then they do so toil for every line that what to you does easy seem and plain is the hard issue of their labouring brain and some of the effects of all their pains we see is but to mimic good extempore. Others by long converse about the town have wit enough to write a lewd lampoon, but if their chief skill lies in a body song, in short, the only wit that's now the fashion is but the gleanings of good conversation. As for the author of this coming play, I asked him what he thought fit I should say, in thanks for your good company to-day, he called me fool, and said it was well known you came here not for our sakes, but your own. New plays are stuffed with wits and with debauches, that crowd and sweat like sits in mayday coaches. Dramatis Personae Narrated by Libby Gone Don Antonio, the Viceroy's son Read by Ernst Patinama Don Pedro, a noble Spaniard, his friend Read by Alan Mapstone. Belleville, an English colonel in love with Florinda. Read by M.B. Wilmore, the rover. Read by Robin King. Frederick, an English gentleman and friend to Belleville and Blunt. Read by Lambda. Blunt, an English country gentleman. Read by Algie Pug. Stefano, servant to Don Pedro. Read by Rick F. Filippo, Luceta's gallant. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Sancho, pimp to Luceta. Read by Dustin Tuttle. Risky and Sebastian, two bravos to Angelica. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Diego, page to Don Antonio. Read by Anna Simon. Page to Helena. Read by Ellie Cat. Boy, page to Belleville. Read by Patty Cunningham. Blunt's man. Read by Dustin Tuttle. Officers and soldiers. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Read by Dustin Tuttle. Florinda, sister to Don Pedro. Read by Amanda Friday. Helena, a gay young woman designed for a nun and sister to Florinda. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Valeria, a kinswoman to Florinda. Read by Avaii. Angelica Bianca, a famous courtesan. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Moretta, her woman. Read by Charlotte Duckett. Callis. Governess to Florinda and Helena. Read by Patty Cunningham. Luceta, a jilting wench. Read by Ellie Cat. Servants, other masqueraders, men and women. Read by Avaii. Read by Ellie Cat. Read by Anna Simon. Scene. Naples in Carnival Time. Act One. Scene One. A Chamber. Enter Florinda and Helena. What an impertinent thing is a young girl bred in a nunnery. How full of questions! Prithee, no more, Helena. I have told thee more than thou understandst already. The more's my grief. I would fain know as much as you. 
which makes me so inquisitive. Nor is't enough to know you're a lover, unless you tell me too who tis you sigh for. When you are a lover, I'll think you fit for a secret of that nature. Tis true. I never was a lover yet. But I begin to have a shrewd guess what tis to be so, and fancy it very pretty to sigh, and sing, and blush, and wish, and dream, and wish, and long, and wish to see the man and when I do look pale and tremble, just as you did when my brother brought home the fine English colonel to see you. What do you call him? Don Belleville? By Helena. That blush betrays you. I am sure tis so. Or is it Don Antonio, the viceroy's son? Or perhaps the rich old Don Vincenzio, whom my father designs for your husband? Why do you blush again? with indignation, and how near soever my father thinks I am to marrying that hated object, I shall let him see I understand better what's due to my beauty, birth, and fortune, and more to my soul, than to obey those unjust commands. Now hang me if I don't love thee for that dear disobedience. I love mischief strangely, as most of our sex do, who are come to love nothing else. But tell me, dear Florinda, don't you love that fine Anglaisy? For I vow next to loving him myself, twill please me most that you do so, for he is so gay and so handsome. Helena, a maid designed for a nun ought not to be so curious in a discourse of love. <laughs> and dost thou think that I'll ever be a nun? Or at least till I'm so old I'm fit for nothing else? Faith, no, sister. And that which makes me long to know whether you love Belleville is because I hope he has some mad companion or other that will spoil my devotion. Nay, I'm resolved to provide myself this carnival, if there be e'er a handsome fellow of my humour above ground, though I ask first. Prithee, be not so wild. Now you have provided yourself with a man, you take no care for poor me. Prithee, tell me, what dost thou see about me that is unfit for love? Have I not a world of youth, a humour gay, a beauty passable, a vigour desirable, well-shaped, clean-limbed, sweet-breathed, and sense enough to know how all these ought to be employed to the best advantage? Yes, I do, and will. Therefore lay aside your hopes of my fortune, by my being a devotee, and tell me how you came acquainted with this Belleville, for I perceive you knew him before he came to Naples. Yes, I knew him at the siege of Pompliano. He was then a colonel of French horse, who in the town was ransacked, nobly treated my brother and myself, preserving us from all insolencies. And I must own, besides great obligations, I have I know not what, that pleads kindly for him about my heart, and will suffer no other to enter. But see, my brother. Enter Don Pedro, Stefano, with a masking habit, and callous. Good morning, sister. Pray, when saw you your lover, Don Vincentio? I know not, sir. Callis, when was he here? For I consider it so little, I know not when it was. I have a command from my father here to tell you, you ought not to despise him. A man of so vast a fortune, and such a passion for you. Stefano, my things. Puts on his masking habit. A passion for me? "'Tis more than e'er I saw, or had a desire should be known. "'I hate Vincentio, and I would not have a man so dear to me as my brother "'follow the ill customs of our country, and make a slave of his sister. "'And, sir, my father's will I am sure you may divert. "'I know not how dear I am to you, "'but I wish only to be ranked in your esteem equal with the English Colonel Belleville. "'Why do you frown and blush?' is there any guilt belongs to the name of that cavalier i'll not deny i value belleville when i was exposed to such dangers as the licensed lust of common soldiers threatened when rage and conquest flew through the city then belleville this criminal for my sake threw himself into all dangers to save my honour and will you not allow him my esteem yes pay him what you will in honour but you must consider Don Vincentio's fortune, and the jointure he'll make you. Let him consider my youth, 
beauty, and fortune, which ought not to be thrown away on his age and jointure. Tis true, he's not so young and fine a gentleman as that Belleville. But what jewels will the cavalier present you with? Those of his eyes and heart? And are not those better than any Don Vincencio has brought from the Indies? Why, how now? Has your nunnery breeding taught you to understand the value of hearts and eyes? Better than to believe Vincencio deserves value from any woman. He may perhaps increase her bags, but not her family. This is fine. Go up to your devotions. You are not designed for the conversation of lovers. Aside. Nor saints yet a while, I hope. Is not enough you make a nun of me? But you must cast my sister away, too, exposing her to a worse confinement than a religious life? The girl's mad. Is it a confinement to be carried into the country, to an antient villa, belonging to the family of the Vincentios these five hundred years, and to have no other prospect than that pleasing one of seeing all her own that meets her eyes? A fine air, large fields and gardens where she may walk and gather flowers when by moonlight for i'm sure she dares not encounter with the heat of the sun that were a task only for don vincencio and his indian breeding who loves it in the dog days and if these be her daily divertisements what are those of the night to lie in a wide moth-eaten bedchamber with furniture in fashion in the reign of king sancho the first the bed that which his forefathers lived and died in? Very well. This apartment, new furbished and fitted out for the young wife, he, out of freedom, makes his dressing-room, and being a frugal and a jealous coxcomb, instead of a valet to uncase his feeble carcass, he desires you to do that office. Signs of favour, I'll assure you, and as such as you must not hope for, unless your woman be out of the way. Have you done yet? That honour being past, the giant stretches itself, yawns and sighs a belch or two as loud as a musket, throws himself into bed, and expects you in his foul sheets, and ere you can get yourself undressed, calls you with a snore or two. And are not these fine blessings to a young lady? Have you done yet? And this man you must kiss. Oh, nay, you must kiss none but him, too, and nuzzle through his beard to find his lips, and this you must submit to for three score years, and all for a jointure. For all your character of Don Vincentio, she is as like to marry him as she was before. Marry Don Vincentio? Hang me, such a wedlock would be worse than adultery with another man. I had rather see her in the Hostel de Dieu, to waste her youth there in vows, and be a handmaid to lasers and cripples, than to lose it in such a marriage. Have you considered, sister, that Belleville has no fortune to bring you to, is banished his country, despised at home, and pitied abroad? What, then? The Viceroy's son is better than that old Sir Fisty. Don Vincencio! Don Indian! He thinks he's trading to Gambo still, and would barter himself, that bell and bauble, for your youth and fortune. Callis, take her hence, and lock her up all this carnival, and at Lent she shall begin her everlasting penance in a monastery. I care not. I had rather be a nun than be obliged to marry as you would have me, if I were designed for it. Do not fear the blessing of that choice. You shall be a nun. Aside. Shall I so? You may chance to be mistaken in my way of devotion. A nun? Yes, I am like to make a fine nun. I have an excellent humour for a great. No. I'll have a saint of my own to pray to shortly, if I like any that dares venture on me. Callis, make it your business to watch this wild cat. As for you, Florinda, I've only tried you all this while, and urged my father's will. But mine is that you would love Antonio. He is brave and young, 
and all that can complete the happiness of a gallant maid this absence of my father will give us opportunity to free you from vincentio by marrying here which you must do to-morrow 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 or twill be too late tis not my friendship to antonio which makes me urge this but my love to thee and hatred to vincentio therefore resolve upon to-morrow sir i shall strive to do as shall become your sister i'll both believe and trust you adieu exeunt pedro and stefano as become his sister that is to be resolved your way as he is his helena goes to callis i ne'er till now perceived my ruin near i've no defence against antonio's love for he has all the advantages of nature the moving arguments of youth and fortune but hark you callis you would not be so cruel to lock me up indeed will you i must obey the commands i hate besides do you consider what a life you are going to lead yes callis that of a nun until then i'll be indebted a world of prayers to you if you now let me see what i ne'er did the divertisements of a carnival what go in masquerade t'll be a fine farewell to the world i take it pray what would you do there that which all the world does as i am told be as mad as the rest and take all innocent freedom sister you'll go too will you not Oh, come prithee be not sad we'll outwit twenty brothers if you'll be ruled by me come put off this dull humour with your clothes and assume one as gay and as fantastic as the dress my cousin valeria and i have provided and let's ramble callis will you give us leave to go aside i have a youthful itch of going myself madam if i thought your brother might not know it and i might wait on you for by my troth i'll not trust young girls alone thou seest my brothers already gone and thou shalt attend and watch us enter stefano madam the habits are come and your cousin valeria is dressed and stays for you tis well i'll write a note and if i chance to see belleville and want an opportunity to speak to him that shall let him know what i've resolved in favour of him come let's in and dress us Exeunt. Scene two. A long street. Enter Belleville, Melancholy, Blunt, and Frederick. Why? What the devil is the colonel, in a time when all the world is gay, to look like a mere lent thus? Hadst thou been long enough in Naples to have been in love, I should have sworn some such judgment had befallen thee. No, I've made no new amours since I came to Naples. You have left none behind you in Paris. <sighs> Neither i can't divine the cause then unless the old cause the want of money and another old cause the want of a wench would that that revive you you're mistaken ned nay sartlikens then thou art past cure i have found it out thou hast renewed thy acquaintance with the lady that caused thee so many sighs at the siege of pampelona pox on what do you call her her brother is a noble spaniard nephew to the dead general florinda i florinda and will nothing serve thy turn but the damned virtuous woman whom on my conscience thou lost in spite to because thou seest little or no possibility of gaining her thou art mistaken i have interest enough in that lovely virgin's heart to make me proud and vain were it not abated by the severity of a brother who perceiving my happiness has civilly forbidden thee the house tis so to make way for a powerful rival the viceroy's son who has the advantage of me in being a man of fortune a spaniard and her brother's friend which gives him liberty to make his court whilst i have recourse only to letters and distant looks from her window which are as soft and kind as those which heaven sends down on penitence he de sartlikens simile by this light the man is quite spoiled frederick what the devil are we made of that we cannot be thus concerned for a wench sartlikens our coopards are like the cooks of a camp they can roost or boil a woman but they have none of the fine tricks to set em off no hogos to make the sauce pleasant and the stomach sharp i dare swear i have had hundred as young kind and handsome as this florinda and dogs eat me 
if they were not as troublesome to me at morning as they were welcome overnight. And yet, I warrant, he would not touch another woman if he might have her for nothing. That's thy joy, a cheap whore. Why, to sat lickens, I love a frank soul. When did you ever hear of an honest woman that took a man's money? I warrant em good uns. But, gentlemen, you may be free, you being kept so poor with parliaments and protectors, that the little stock you have is not worth preserving. But I thank my stars, I have more grace than to forfeit my estate by cavalierin'. But thinks only following the court should be sufficient to entitle them to that? Sartly, Gens. They know I follow it to no good, unless they pick a hole in my coat for lending you money now and then, which is a greater crime to my conscience, gentlemen, than to the Commonwealth. Enter Wilmore. Ha! Dear Belleville, noble colonel. Wilmore! Welcome ashore, my dear rover. What happy wind blew us this good fortune? Let me salute you, my dear Fred. And then command me. How is it, honest lad? Faith, sir, the old compliment. Infinitely the better to see my dear mad Wilmore again. Prithee, why camest thou ashore? And vast the prince. He's well, and reigns still lord of the watery element. I must aboard again within a day or two, and my business ashore was only to enjoy myself a little this carnival. Pray, um, know our new friend, sir. He's but bashful, a raw traveller, but honest, stout, and one of us. Embraces Blunt. That you esteem him gives him an interest here. Your servant, sir. But well, faith, I'm glad to meet you again in a warm climate, where the kind sun has its godlike power still over the wine and woman. Love and mirth are my business in Naples, and if I mistake not the place, here's an excellent market for chapmen of my humour. See, here be those kind merchants of love you look for. Enter several men in masking habits, some playing on music, others dancing after. Women dressed like courtesans, with papers pinned to their breasts and baskets of flowers in their hands. Sartlikens, what have we here? Now the game begins. Fine, pretty creatures. May a stranger have leave to look and love? What's here? Roses for every month. Read the paper. Roses for every month? What means that? They are, or would have you think they are, courtesans, who here in Naples are to be hired by the month. Kind and obliging to inform us. Pray, where do these roses grow? I would fain plant some of them in a bed of mine. Beware such roses, sir. A pox of fear. I'll be baked with thee between a pair of sheets. And that's thy proper still, so I might but strow such roses over me and under me. Fair one, would you would give me leave to gather at your bush this idle month? I'd go near to make somebody smell of it all the year after. And thou hast need of such a remedy, for thou stinkst of tar and rope ends like a dock or pest house. A woman puts herself into the hands of a man and exit. Nay, nay, you shall not leave me so. By all means, use no violence here. Death! Just as I was going to be damnably in love, to have her led off. I pluck that rose out of his hand and even kiss the bed, the bush it grew in. No friend to love like a long voyage at sea. Except the nunnery, Fred. Death! But will they not be kind? Quickly, be kind. Thou knowest I'm no tame sire. The rampant lion of the forest. Two men dressed all over with horns of several sorts, making grimaces at one another, with papers pinned on their backs, advance from the farther end of the scene. Oh, the fantastical rogues! How they are dressed! Tis a satire against the whole sex! Is this a fruit that grows in this warm country? Yes, tis pretty to see these Italians start, swell, and stab at the word cuckold, and yet stumble at horns on every threshold. See what's on their back. Flowers for every night. Ha, <laughs> rogue! And more sweet than roses of every month. This is a gardener of Adam's own breeding. They dance. What think you of those grave people? So wake in Essex half so mad or extravagant. I like their sober, grave way. It is a kind of authorised fornication, where the men are not chid for it, nor the women despised as amongst our dull English. Even the monsieurs want that part of good manners. 
but here in Italy a monsieur is the humblest, best-bred gentleman. Duels are so baffled by bravos that an age shows not one but between a Frenchman and a hangman, who is as much too hard for him on the piazza as they are for a Dutchman on the new bridge. But see, I love the crew. Enter Florinda, Helena, and Valeria, dressed like gypsies, Callus and Stefano, Luceta, Filippo, and Sancho in masquerade. Sister, there's your Englishman, and with him a handsome proper fellow. I'll to him, and instead of telling him his fortune, try my own. Gypsies on my life. Sure, these will prattle if a man cross their hands. Goes to Helena. Dear, pretty, and I hope young devil, will you tell an amorous stranger what luck is like to have? Have a care how you venture with me, sir, lest I pick your pocket, which will more vex your English humour than an Italian fortune will please you. How the devil camest thou to know my country and humour? The first, I guess, by a certain forward impudence which does not displease me at this time, and the loss of your money will vex you, because I hope you have but very little to lose. He gets, child, thou art in the right. It is so little I dare not offer it thee for a kindness. But cannot you divine what other things of more value I have about me that I would willingly part with? Indeed, no, that's the business of a witch, and I am but a gypsy yet. Yet, without looking in your hand, I have a parlous guess. Tis some foolish heart, you mean, an inconstant English heart, as little worth stealing as your purse. Nay, then thou dost deal with the devil, that's certain. Thou hast guessed as right as if thou hadst been one of that number it has languished for. I find you'll be better acquainted with it, nor can you take it in a better time, for I am come from sea, child, and Venus not being propitious to me in her own element, I have a world of love in store. Would you would be good-natured and take summon it off my hands? Why, I could be inclined that way. But for a foolish vow I am going to make, to die a maid. Then thou art damned without redemption. And as I am a good Christian, I ought in charity to divert so wicked a design Therefore, prithee, dear creature, let me know quickly when and where I shall begin to set a helping hand to so good a work. If you should prevail with my tender heart, as I begin to fear you will, for you have horrible loving eyes, there will be difficulty in it that you'll hardly undergo for my sake. Faith, child, I've been bred in dangers and wear a sword that has been employed in a worse cause than for a handsome kind woman. Name the danger. Let it be anything but a long siege, and I'll undertake it. Can you storm? Oh, most furiously. What think you of a nunnery wall? For he that wins me must gain that first. A nun? Oh, how I love thee for it. There's no sinner like a young saint. Nay, now, there's no denying me. The old law had no curse to a woman like dying a maid. Witness Jephthah's daughter. A very good text this, if well handled. And I perceive, Father Captain, you would impose no severe penance on her who was inclined to console herself before she took orders. If she be young and handsome. Ay, there's it. But if she be not. By this hand, child, I have an implicit faith, and dare venture on thee with all faults. Besides, "'Tis more meritorious to leave the world when thou hast tasted and proved the pleasure on it, than t'will be a virtue in thee which now will be pure ignorance. "'I perceive, good father captain, you design only to make me fit for heaven. "'But if on the contrary you should quite divert me from it, and bring me back to the world again, "'I should have a new man to seek, I find, and what a grief that will be. "'For when I begin I fancy I shall love like anything.' I never tried yet. Egad, and that's kind. Prithee, dear creature, give me credit for a heart. For faith, I'm a very honest fellow. Ah, oh, I long to come first to the banquet of love, and such a swinging appetite I bring. Ah, oh, I'm impatient. Thy lodging, sweetheart, thy lodging, or I'm a dead man. 
why must we be either guilty of fornication or murder if we converse with you men? And is there no difference between leave to love me and leave to lie with me? Faith, child, they were made to go together. Are you sure this is the man? Pointing to Blunt. When did I mistake your game? This is a stranger. I know by his gazing. If he be brisk, he'll venture to follow me. And then, if I understand my trade, he's mine. He's English, too, and they say that's a sort of good-natured loving people, and have generally so kind an opinion of themselves, that a woman with any wit may flatter em into any sort of fool she pleases. Tis so. She is taken. I have booties which my false glass at home did not discover. She often passes by Blunt and gazes on him. He struts and cocks and walks and gazes on her. This woman watches me so. I shall get no opportunity to discover myself to him, and so miss the intent of my coming. But as I was saying, sir, by this line you should be a lover. Looking in his hand. I thought how right you guessed. All men are in love. I pretend to be so. Come, let me go. I'm weary of this fooling. Walks away. I will not, till you have confessed whether the passion that you have vowed Florinda be true or false. She holds him. He strives to get from her. Florinda! Turns quickly towards her. Softly. Thou hast named one will fix me here, for ever. She'll be disappointed, then. Who expects you this night at the garden gate? And if you'll fail not, as let me see the other hand, you will go near to do. She vows to die, or make you happy. Looks on Callus, who observes him. What canst thou mean? That which I say. Farewell. Offers to go. Oh, charming Sibyl, stay! Complete that joy which, as it is, will turn into distraction. Where must I be? At the garden gate? I know it. At night, you say. I'll, I'll sooner forfeit heaven than disobey. Enter Don Pedro and other maskers, and pass over the stage. Madam, your brother is here. Take this to instruct you farther. Gives him a letter and goes off. Have a care, sir. What you promise? This may be a trap laid by her brother to ruin you. Do not disturb my happiness with doubts. Opens the letter. My dear pretty creature, a thousand blessings on thee. Still in this habit, you say, and after dinner at this place. Yes, if you will swear to keep your heart, and not bestow it between this time and that. By all the little gods of love, I swear. I'll leave it with you, and if you run away with it, those deities of justice will revenge me. Exeunt all the women except Luceta. Do you know the hat? Tis Florinda's. All oh, blessings fall upon the virtuous maid. Nay, no idolatry. A sober sacrifice, I'll love you. Oh, friends, the welcomest news, the softest letter. Nay, you shall see it. And could you now be serious, I might be made the happiest man the sun shines on. The reason of this mighty joy? See, how kindly she invites me to deliver her from the threatened violence of her brother. Will you not assist me? I know not what thou meanest, but I'll make one to any mischief where a woman's concerned. But she'll be grateful to us for the favour, will she not? How mean you? How should I mean? Thou knowest there's but one way for a woman to oblige me. Don't profane. The maid is nicely virtuous. Who, pox? Then she's fit for nothing but a husband. Let her in go, Colonel. Peace. She's the girl's mistress, sir. Let her be the devil. If she be thy mistress, I'll serve her. Name the way. Read here this postscript. Gives him a letter. At ten at night, at the garden gate of which, if I cannot get the key, I will contrive a way over the wall. Come attended with a friend, or two. Kind heart, if we three cannot weave a string to let her down a garden wall, to a pity but the hangman wove one for us all. Let her alone for that. Your woman's wit, your fair kind woman, will trick out a brother or a Jew, and contrive like a Jesuit in chains. But see, Ned Blunt is stolen out after the lure of a damsel. Exeunt Blunt and Luceta. So he'll scarce find his way home again, unless we get him cried by the bellmen in the marketplace, and twould sound prettily. 
a lost english boy of thirty i hope tis some common crafty sinner one that will fit him it may be she will sell him for peru the rogue's sturdy and would work well in a mine at least i hope she will dress him for our mirth cheat him of all then have him well favouredly banged and turned out naked at night prithee what humour is he of that you wish him so well why of an english elder brother's humour educated in a nursery with a maid to tend him till fifteen and lies with his grandmother till he's of age one that knows no pleasure beyond riding to the next fair or going up to london with his right worshipful father in parliament time wearing gay clothes or making honourable love to his lady mother's laundry maid gets drunk at a hunting match and ten to one then gives some proofs of his prowess a pox upon him he's our banker and he has all our cash about him and if he fail we are all broke oh let him alone for that matter he's of the damned stingy quality that will secure our stock i know not in what danger it were indeed if the jill should pretend she is in love with him for it is a kind believing coxcomb otherwise if he part with more than a piece of eight gall him for which offer he may have a chance to be beaten if she be a hoe of the first rank nay the rogue will not be easily beaten he's stout enough perhaps if they talk beyond his capacity he may chance to exercise his courage upon some of them else i'm sure they'll find it as difficult to beat as to please him tis a lucky devil to light upon so kind a wench thou hadst a great deal of talk with thy little gypsy couldst thou do no good upon her for mine was hard-hearted hang her she was some damned honest person of quality i'm sure she was so very free and witty if her face but be answerable to her wit and humour i would be bound to constancy this month to gain her in the meantime have you made no kind acquaintance since you came to town you do not use to be honest so long gentlemen faith law has kept us honest we have all been fired up with the beauty newly come to town the famous paduana angelica bianca what the mistress of the dead spanish general yes she's now the only adored beauty of all the youth in naples who put on all their charms to appear lovely in her sight their coaches liveries and themselves all gay as on a monarch's birthday to attract the eyes of this fair charmer while well, she has the pleasure to behold all languish for her that see her tis pretty to see how much love the men regard her and how much envy the women what gallant has she <laughs> none she's exposed to sale and four days in the week she's yours for so much a month the very thought of it quenches all manner of fire in me yet prithee let's see her well, let's first to dinner and after that we'll pass the day as you please but at night you must all be at my devotion i will not fail you exeunt end of act one Act Two of The Rover, Part One by Aphra Ben. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One The Long Street. Enter Belleville and Frederick in masking habits, and Wilmore in his own clothes, with a wizard in his hand. But why thus disguised and muzzled? Because whatever extravagances we commit in these faces our own may not be obliged to answer em i should have changed my eternal buff too but no matter my little gypsy would not have found me out then for if she should change hers it is impossible i should know her unless i should hear her prattle a pox on it i cannot get her out of my head pray heaven if i ever do see her again she prove damnable ugly that i may fortify myself against her tongue have a care love for of my conscience she was not of a quality to give thee any hopes pox on em why do they draw a man in then she has played with my heart so that twill never lie still till i have met with some kind wench that will play the game out with me Ooh, for my arms full of soft white kind woman such as i fancy angelica this is her house if you were but in stock to get admittance they have not dined yet I perceive the picture is not out. Enter Blunt. I long to see the shadow of the fair substance. A man may gaze on that for nothing. 
Colonel, thy hand, and thine, Fred, a very coxcomb from my birth till this hour, and heartily repent my little faith. What the devil's the matter with thee, Ned? Oh, such a mistress, Fred, such a girl. Ha! Where? Ay, where? So fond, so amorous, so doing and fine, and all for sheer love, he rogue. Oh, how she looked and kissed and soothed my heart from my bosom. I cannot think I was awake, and yet methinks I see and feel her charm still. Fred, try if she have not left the taste of her balmy kisses upon my lips. Kisses him. Ha, ha, ha. Aye. Where? What a dog I was to stay in dull England so long. How have I laughed at the colonel when he sighed for love? But no, the little archer has revenged him, and by his own dart I can guess at all his joys, which then I took for fancies, mere dreams and fables. Well, I'm resolved to sell all in Essex and plant here for ever. What a blessing tis thou hast a mistress thou darest boast of, for I know thy humour is rather to have a proclaimed clap than a secret amour. Dost know her name? Her name? No, sad Lickens. What care I for names? She's fair, young, brisk, and kind, even to rubbishment. And what a pox care I for knowing her by another title? Didst give her anything? Give her? Ha, ha, ha! Why, she's a person of quality. That's a good un. Give her her. Sad Lakens, dost think such creatures are to be bought? Or are we provided for such a purchase? Give her, quoth ye. Why, she presented me with this bracelet, for a toy of a diamond I used to wear. No, gentlemen, Ned Blunt is not for everybody. She expects me again to-night. Egad, that's well. We'll all go. Not a soul. No, gentlemen, you are wits. I am a dull country rogue, I. Well, sir, for all your person of quality, I shall be very glad to understand your purse be secure. Tis our old estate at present, which we are loth to hazard in one bottom. Come, sir, unload. Take a necessary trifle, useless now to me, that I'm beloved by such a gentlewoman. Sartlikens, money. Here, take mine too. No, keep that to be cousin, that we may laugh. Cousined? Death! Would I could meet with one that would cousin me of all the love I could spare tonight. Pox, tis some common hoe upon my life. A uh ha -huh. Yes, with such clothes, such jewels, such a house, such furniture, and so attended. A uh ha -huh. Why, yes, sir, they are whores, though they'll neither entertain you with drinking, swearing, or bawdy. Our whores, in all those gay clothes and right jewels, our whores, with great houses richly furnished with velvet beds, store of plate, handsome attendants, and fine coaches, our whores, and errant ones. Pox on it, where do these fine whores live? Where no rogue in office eclept constables dare give them laws, nor the wine-bellied bullies of the town break their windows, yet they are whores. Though this Essex calf believe them persons of quality. Sartlikens, you old fools. There are things about this Essex calf that shall take with the ladies beyond all your wits and parts. This shape and size, gentlemen, are not to be despised. My waist tolerably long, with other inviting signs that shall be nameless. Egad, I believe he may have met with some person of quality that may be kind to him. Dost thou perceive any such tempting things about him should make a fine woman and of quality pick him out from all mankind to throw away her youth and beauty upon? Nay, and her dear heart, too? No, no, Angelica has raised the price too high. May she languish for all mankind till she die, and be damned for that one sin alone. Enter two bravos, and hang up a great picture of Angelica's against the balcony, and two little ones on each side of the door. See there, the fair sign to the inn where a man may lodge that's fool enough to give her price. Wilmore gazes on the picture. Sartlikens, gentlemen, what's this? A famous courtesan that's to be sold. Uh, how? 
to be sold nay then i have nothing to say to her sold what impudence is practised in this country with order and decency whoreeks established here by virtue of the inquisition come let's be gone i'm sure we know a chapman for this commodity thou art none i am sure unless thou couldst have her in thy bed at the price of a couch in the street how wondrous fair she is a thousand crowns a month by heaven as many kingdoms were too little plague of this poverty of which i ne'er complain but when it hinders my approach to beauty which virtue ne'er could purchase turns from the picture what's this reads a thousand crowns a month sartlikens here's a sum sure it is a mistake hark you friend does she take or give so much by the month a thousand crowns why tis a portion for the infanta hark ye friends won't she trust this is a trade sir that cannot live by credit enter don pedro in masquerade followed by stephano see here's more company let's walk off for a while pedro reads exeunt english enter angelica and moretta in the balcony and draw a silk curtain fetch me a thousand crowns i never wish to buy this beauty at an easier rate passes off prithee what said those fellows to thee madam the first were admirers of beauty only but no purchasers they were merry with your price and picture laughed at the sum and so passed off no matter i'm not displeased with their rallying their wonder feeds my vanity and he that wishes to buy gives me more pride than he that gives my price can make me pleasure madam the last i knew through all his disguises to be don pedro nephew to the general and who was with him in pamplona don pedro my old gallant's nephew when his uncle died he left him a vast sum of money it is he who was so in love with me at padua and who used to make the general so jealous is that he who used to prance before our window and take such care to show himself an amorous ass if i am not mistaken he is the likest man to give your price the man is brave and generous but of an humour so uneasy and inconstant that the victory over his heart is as soon lost as won a slave that can add little to the triumph of the conqueror but inconstancy is the sin of all mankind therefore i'm resolved that nothing but gold shall charm my heart i'm glad on't tis only interest that women of our profession ought to consider though i wonder what kept you from that general disease of our sex so long i mean that of being in love a kind but sullen star under which i had the happiness to be born yet i have had no time for love the bravest and noblest of mankind have purchased my favours at so dear a rate as if no coin but gold were current with our trade but here's don pedro again fetch me my lute for tis for him or don antonio the viceroy's son that i have spread my nets enter at one door don pedro and stefano don antonio and diego his page at the other door with people following him in masquerade antically attired some with music they both go up to the picture a thousand crowns had not the painter flattered her i should not think it dear flattered her by heaven he cannot i have seen the original nor is there one charm here more than adorns her face and eyes all this soft and sweet with a certain languishing air that no artist can represent what i heard of her beauty before had fired my soul but this confirmation of it has blown it into a flame ha huh. sir i have known you throw away a thousand crowns on a ware's face and though you are near your marriage you may venture a little love here florinda will not miss it aside ha huh. florinda sure tis antonio florinda name not those distant joys there's not one thought of her will check my passion here florinda scorned and all my hopes defeated at the possession of angelica a noise of a lute above antonio gazes up 
her injuries by heaven he shall not boast of song to a lute above when damon first began to love he languished in a soft desire and knew not how the gods to move to lessen or increase his fire for celia in her charming eyes wore all love's sweet and all his cruelties but as beneath the shade he lay weaving of flowers for celia's hair she chanced to lead her flock that way and saw the amorous shepherd there she gazed around upon the place and saw the grove resembling night to all the joys of love invite whilst guilty smiles and blushes dressed her face at this the bashful youth all transport grew and with kind force he taught the virgin how to yield what all his sighs could never do by heaven she's charming fair angelica throws open the curtains and bows to antonio who pulls off his vizard and bows and blows up kisses pedro unseen looks in his face tis he the false antonio to the bravo friend where must i pay my offering of love my thousand crowns i mean that offering i have designed to make and yours will come too late prithee be gone i shall grow angry else and then thou art not safe my anger may be fatal sir as yours and he that enters here may prove this truth I know not who thou art, but I am sure thou art worth my killing and aiming at Angelica. They draw and fight. Answer Wilmore and Blunt, who draw and part him. Sartlikens, here's a fine doins. Tilting for the wench, I'm sure. Nay, gad, if that would win her, I have as good a sword as the best of ye. Put up, put up, and take another time and place, for this is designed for lovers only. We are prevented. Dare you meet me tomorrow on the Molo? For I've a title to a better quarrel, that of Florinda, in whose credulous heart thou'st made an interest and destroyed my hopes. Dare, I'll meet thee there as early as the day. We will come thus disguised, that whosoever chance to get the better, he may escape unknown. It shall be so. Exeunt Pedro and Stefano. Who shall this rival be? unless the english colonel of whom i have often heard don pedro speak it must be he and time he were removed who lays a claim to all my happiness wilmore having gazed all this while on the picture pulls down a little one this posture's loose and negligent the sight on it would beget a warm desire in souls whom impotence and age had chilled this must along with me what means this rudeness sir restore the picture ha rudeness committed to the fair angelica restore the picture sir indeed i will not sir by heaven but you shall nay do not show your sword if you do by this dear beauty i will show mine too what right can you pretend to it that of possession which i will maintain you perhaps have the thousand crowns to give for the original no matter sir you shall restore the picture oh moretta what's the matter or leave your life behind Death, you lie. I will do neither. Hold, I command you, if for me you fight. They fight. The Spaniards join with Antonio, blunt laying on like mad. They leave off and bow. How heavenly fair she is! Oh, plague of her price! You, sir, in buff, you that appear a soldier that first began this insolence. Tis true, I did so, if you call it insolence for a man to preserve himself. I saw your charming picture and was wounded. Quite through my soul each pointed beauty ran, and wanting a thousand crowns to procure my remedy, I laid this little picture to my bosom, 
which if you cannot allow me, I'll resign. No, you may keep the trifle. You shall first ask my leave, and this. Fight again as before. Enter Belleville and Frederick, who join with the English. Hold, will you ruin me? Bisky, Sebastian, part them. The Spaniards are beaten off. Oh, madam, we're undone. A pox upon that rude fellow. He's set on to ruin us. We shall never see good days till all these fighting poor rogues are sent to the galleys. Enter Belleville, Blunt, and Wilmore with his shirt bloody. Sartlikens, beat me at this spot, and I'll ne'er wear a sword more. The devil's in thee for a mad fellow. Thou art always one at an unlikely adventure. Come, let's be gone while we're safe. And remember, these are Spaniards, the sort of people that know how to revenge an affront. To Wilmore. You bleed? I hope you're not wounded. Not much. A plague upon your dons. If they fight no better, they'll ne'er recover Flanders. What the devil was it to them that I took down the picture? Took it? Sartlikens. We'll have the great one too. Tis ours by conquest. Prithee, help me up, and I'll pull it down. Stay, sir, and ere you affront me further, let me know how you durst commit this outrage. To you I speak, sir, for you appear like a gentleman. To me, madam. Gentleman, your servant. Is the devil in me? Dost thou know the danger of entering a house of an incensed courtesan? I thank you for your care, but there are other matters in hand. There are, though we have no great temptation. Death, let me go. Yes, to your lodging, if you will, but not in here. Damn these gay hair lords. By this hand I'll have as sound and handsome a hoe for a patacon. Death, man, she will murder thee. Oh, fear me not. Shall I not venture where a beauty calls? A lovely, charming beauty? For fear of danger, when by heaven there's none so great as to long for her, whilst I want money to purchase her. Therefore tis loss of time, unless you had a thousand crowns to pay. It may be she may give a favour. At least I shall have the pleasure of saluting her when I enter, and when I depart. Pox! She'll as soon lie with thee as kiss thee, and sooner stab than do either. You shall not go. Fear not, sir. All I have to wound with is my eyes. Let him go. Sartlikens, I believe the gentlewoman means well. Well, take thy fortune. We'll expect you in the next street. Farewell, fool. Farewell. Bye, Colonel. Goes in. The rogues start mad for revenge. Exeunt. Scene two. A fine chamber. Enter Wilmore, Angelica, and Moretta. Insolent, sir, how durst you pull down my picture? Rather, how durst you set it up to tempt poor amorous mortals with so much excellence, which I find you have but too well consulted by the unmerciful price you set upon it? Is all this heaven of beauty shown to move despair in those that cannot buy? And can you think the effects of that despair should be less extravagant than I have shown? I sent for you to ask my pardon, sir, not to aggravate your crime. I thought I should have seen you at my feet imploring it. You were deceived. I came to rail at you and talk such truths too as shall let you see the vanity of that pride which taught you how to set such a price on sin. For such it is whilst that which is loved you is meanly bartered for. <laughs> Alas, good captain, what pity tis your edifying doctrine will do no good upon me. Moretta, fetch the gentleman a glass, and let him survey himself to see what charms he has, and guess my business. He knows himself of old. I believe those breaches, and he have been acquainted ever since he was beaten at Worcester. Nay, do not abuse the poor creature. Good weather-beaten corporal, will you march off? We have no need for your doctrine though you have of our charity. But at present we have no scraps. We can afford no kindness for God's sake. In fine, sirrah, the price is too high in the mouth for you. Therefore troop, I say. Here, good forewoman of the shop, serve me, and I'll be gone. Keep it to pay your landress. Your linen stinks over the gun-room, for he is no selling by retail. Thou hast sold plenty of thy stale ware at a cheap rate. Ay, the more silly kind heart, I. But this is an age where beauty is at the highest rate. In fine, you know the price of this. I grant you, tis here set down a thousand crowns a month. Board, take your black lead and sum it up, that I may have a pistol worth of these bane gay things, and I'll trouble you no more. Pox on him, he'll fret me to death. Abominable fellow, I tell thee we only sell by whole piece. 
It is very hard. The whole cargo or nothing. Faith, madam, my stock will not reach it. I cannot be your chapman. Yet I have countrymen in town, merchants of love like me. I'll see if they'll put for a share. We cannot lose much by it, and what we have no use for will sell upon Friday Smart. At uh, Who gives more? I am studying, madam, how to purchase you, although at present I am unprovided of money. Sure, this from any other man would anger me, nor shall he know the conquest he has made. Poor angry man, how I despise this railing. Yes. I am poor, but I'm a gentleman, and one that scorns this baseness which you practice. Poor as I am, I would not sell myself, no, not to gain your charming high-prized person. Though I admire you strangely for your beauty, yet I condemn your mind. And yet I would at any rate enjoy you, at your own rate, but cannot. See here, the only sum I can command on earth. I know not where to eat when this is gone. Yet such a slave I am to love and beauty. This last reserve I'll sacrifice to enjoy you. Nay, do not frown. I know you are to be bought, and would be bought, by me. By me, for a mean trifling sum, if I could pay it down. Which happy knowledge I will still repeat, and lay it to my heart. It has a virtue in it and will soon cure these wounds your eyes have made. And yet, there's something so divinely powerful there. Nay, I will gaze to let you see my strength. Holds her, looks on her, and pauses and sighs. Ah, oh, by heaven, bright creature, I would not for the world thy fame were half so fair as is thy face. Turns her away from him. Aside. His words go through me to the very soul. If you have nothing else to say to me... Yes, you shall hear how infamous you are, for which I do not hate thee, but that secures my heart, and all the flames it feels are but so many lusts. I know it by their sudden bold intrusion. The fire's impatient and betrays. It is false. For had it been the purer flame of love, I should have pined and languished at your feet, ere found the impudence to have discovered it. I now dare stand your scorn and your denial. Sure she's bewitched that she can stand us tamely and hear this saucy railing. Sirrah, will you be gone? To Moretta. How dare you take this liberty? Withdraw. Pray tell me, sir, are not you guilty of the same mercenary crime? When a lady is proposed to you for a wife, you never ask how fair, discreet, or virtuous she is, but what's her fortune? which, if but small, you cry, she will not do my business, and basely leave her, though she languish for you. Say, is not this as poor? It is a barbarous custom which I will scorn to defend in our sex, and do despise in yours. Thou art a brave fellow. Put up thy gold, and know, that were thy fortune large, as is thy soul, thou shouldst not buy my love. Couldst thou forget those mean effects of vanity which set me out to sail, and as a lover prize my yielding joys. Canst thou believe they'll be entirely thine without considering they were mercenary? I cannot tell. I must bethink me first. Aside. Ah, death. I'm going to believe her. Prithee, confirm that faith. Or if thou canst not, flatter me a little. Twill please me from thy mouth. Curse on thy charming tongue. Dost thou return my feigned contempt with so much subtlety? Thou hast found the easiest way into my heart. Though I yet know that all thou sayest is false. Turning from her in a rage, aside. By all that's good, tis real. I never loved before, though oft a mistress. Shall my first vows be slighted? What can she mean? I find you cannot credit me. I know you mean to take me for an errant ass, an ass that may be soothed into belief and then be used at pleasure. But, madam, I have so often been cheated by perjured, soft, deluding hypocrites that I've no faith left for the cozening sex, especially for women of your trade. The low esteem you have of me perhaps may bring my heart again, for I have pride that yet surmounts my love. She turns with pride. He holds her. Throw off this pride, this enemy to bliss, and show the power of love. 
is with those arms only I can be vanquished and made a slave. Is all my mighty expectation vanished? No, I will not hear thee talk. Thou hast a charm in every word that draws my heart away. And all the thousand trophies I designed thou hast undone. Why art thou soft? Thy looks are bravely rough and meant for war. Could thou not storm on still? I then perhaps had been as free as thou. Aside. Death, how she throws her fire about my soul. Take heed, fair creature, how you raise my hopes, which once assumed pretend to all dominion. There's not a joy thou hast in store I shall not then command, for which I'll pay thee back my soul, my life. Come, let's begin the account this happy minute. And will you pay me then the price I ask? Oh, why dost thou draw from me an awful worship by showing thou art no divinity? Conceal the fiend, and show me all the angel. Keep me but ignorant, and I'll be devout, and pay my vows for ever at this shrine. Kneels and kisses her hand. The pay, I mean, is but thy love for mine. Can you give that? Entirely. Come, let's withdraw, where I'll renew my vows, and breathe them with such ardour, thou shalt not doubt my zeal. Thou hast a power too strong to be resisted. Exeunt, Wilmore and Angelica. Now my curse go with you. Is all our project fallen to this? To love the only enemy to our trades? Nay, to love such a shamaroon, a very beggar, nay, a pirate beggar, whose business is to rifle and be gone, and no purchase, no pay, tatterdemalion, an English picaroon, a rogue that fights for daily drink, and takes prides in being loyally lousy. Oh, I could curse now. I have durst. This is the fate of most whores. End of Act Two Act Three of The Rover, Part One, by Afra Ben. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One a street. Enter Florinda, Valeria, Helena, in antic different dresses from what they were in before, callous attending. I wonder what should make my brother in so ill a humour. I hope he has not found out our ramble this morning. No, if he had, we should have heard on it at both ears, and have been mewed up this afternoon, which I would not for the world should have happened. Oh, hey-ho, I'm as sad as a lover's lute. Well, methinks we have learnt this trade of gypsies as readily as if we had been bred upon the road to Loretto. And yet I did so fumble when I told the stranger his fortune that I was afraid I should have told my own and yours by mistake. But methinks Helena has been very serious ever since. I would give my garter she were in love to be revenged upon her for abusing me. How is Helena? Ah! Oh. Would I had never seen my mad monsieur, and yet for all your laughing I am not in love. And yet this small acquaintance of my conscience will never out of my head. <laughs> I love to think how thou art fitted with a lover, a fellow that I warrant loves every new face he sees. Ha! Huh. He has not kept his word with me here, and may be taken up. That thought is not very pleasant to me. What the deuce should this be now that I feel? What is it like? Nay, the Lord knows. But if I should be hanged, I cannot choose but be angry and afraid, when I think that mad fellow should be in love with anybody but me. What to think of myself I know not. Would I could meet with some true damned gypsy that I might know my fortune? Know it? Why, there's nothing so easy. Thou wilt love this wandering inconstant till thou find'st thyself hanged about his neck, and then be as mad to get free again. Yes, Valeria, we shall see her bestride his baggage horse, and follow him to the campaign. So, so, now you are provided for, there's no care taken of poor me. But since you have set my heart a-wishing, I am resolved to know for what. I will not die of the pip, so I will not. 
Art thou mad to talk so? Who will like thee well enough to have thee, that hears what a mad wench thou art? Like me? I don't intend every he that likes me shall have me, but he that I like. I should have stayed in the nunnery still if I had liked my lady abbess as well as she liked me. No, I came thence, not, as my wise brother imagines, to take an eternal farewell of the world, but to love and to be beloved. And I will be beloved, or I'll get one of your men, so I will. Am I put into the number of lovers? You! My cuz, I know thou art too good-natured to leave us in any design. Thou wouldst venture a cast, though thou comest off a loser, especially with such a gamester. I observed your man, and your willing ears incline that way, and if you are not a lover, tis an art soon learnt. That I find. <sighs> I wonder how you learnt to love so easily. I had a thousand charms to meet my eyes and ears, ere I could yield, and t'was the knowledge of Belleville's merit, not the surprising person, took my soul. Thou art too rash to give a heart at first sight. Hang your considering, lover. I ne'er thought beyond the fancy. That was a very pretty, idle, silly kind of pleasure to pass one's time with. To write little, soft, nonsensical billets, and with great difficulty and danger receive answers. In which I shall have my beauty praised, my wit admired, though little or none, and have the vanity and power to know I am desirable. Then I have the more inclination that way, because I am to be a nun, and so shall not be suspected to have any such earthly thoughts about me. But when I walk thus, and sigh thus, they'll think my mind's upon my monastery, and cry, How happy tis she's so resolved! But not a word of man. What a mad creature's this! I'll warrant, if my brother hears either of you sigh, he cries, gravely, I fear you have the indiscretion to be in love, but take heed of the honour of our house, and of your own unspotted fame. And so he conjures on till he has laid the soft-winged god in your hearts, or broke the bird's nest. But see, here comes your lover. But where's my inconstant? Let's step aside, and we may learn something. Go aside. Enter Belleville, Frederick, and Blunt. What means this? The picture's taken in. It may be that the wench is good-natured, and will be kind gratis. Your friend's a proper handsome fellow. I rather think she has cut his throat and is fled. I am mad that he should throw himself into dangers. Pox on it, I shall want him to-night. Let's knock and ask for him. Oh, my heart goes pit-a-pat, for fear tis my man they talk of. Knock, Moretta, above. What would you have? Tell the stranger that entered here about two hours ago that his friends stay here for him. A curse upon him for Moretta. Would he were at the devil, but he's coming to you. Enter Wilmore. Ay, ay, tis he. Oh, how this vexes me. And how, and how, dear lad, has fortune smiled? Are we to break her windows or raise up altars to her, huh? Does not my fortune sit triumphant on my brow? Does not see the little wanton god there all gay and smiling? Have I not an air about my face and eyes that distinguish me from the crowd of common lovers? By heaven, Cupid's quiver has not half so many darts as her eyes. Oh, such a bona roba to sleep in her arms is lying in fresco, all perfumed air about me. Aside. Here's fine encouragement for me to fool on. Hark ye, where did you purchase that rich canary we drank today? Tell me that I may adore the spigot and sacrifice to the butt. The juice was divine, into which I must dip my rosary, and then bless all things that I would have bold or fortunate. Well, sir, let's go take a bottle and hear the story of your success. Would not French wine do better? Damn the hungry balderdash. Cheerful sack has a generous virtue in it, inspiring a successful confidence, gives eloquence to the tongue and vigour to the soul, and has in a few hours completed all my hopes and wishes. There's nothing left to raise a new desire in me. Come, let's be gay and wanton. And, gentlemen, study, study what you want, for here are 
friends that will supply, gentlemen. Hark what a charming sound they make. Tis he and she gold, whilst here shall beget new pleasures every moment. But hark ye, sir, you are not married, are you? All the honey of matrimony, but none of the sting, friend. Sartlicans, thou'rt a fortunate rogue. I am so, sir. Let these inform you. Ah, how sweetly they chime. Pox of poverty. It makes a man a slave, makes wit and honour sneak. My soul grew lean and rusty for want of credit. Sartlicans, this I like well. It looks like my lucky bargain. Oh, how I long for the approach of my squire that is to conduct me to her house again. Why, here's two provided for. By this light you are happy, men. Fortune is pleased to smile on us, gentlemen. To smile on us. Enter Sancho and pulls Blunt by the sleeve. They go aside. Sir, my lady expects you. She has removed all that might oppose your will and pleasure, and is impatient till you come. Sir, I'll attend you. Oh, the happiest rogue. I'll take no leave, lest they either dog me or stay me. Exit with Sancho. But then the little gypsy is forgot. A mischief on thee for putting her into my thoughts. I had quite forgot her else, and this night's debauch had drunk her quite down. Had it so, good captain? Claps him on the back. Ah! I hope she did not hear. What? Afraid of such a champion? Oh, you're a fine lady of your word, are you not? To make a man languish a whole day. In tedious search of me? Egad, child, thou art in the right. Hadst thou seen what a melancholy dog I have been ever since I was a lover, how I have walked the streets like a capuchin with my hands in my sleeve, faith, sweetheart, thou wouldst pity me. Oh, now, if I should be hanged, I can't be angry with him. He dissembles so heartily. Alas, good captain, what pains you have taken! Now were I ungrateful not to reward so true a servant. Poor soul, that's kindly said, I see thou bearest the conscience. Come then, for a beginning, show me thy dear face. I'm afraid, my small acquaintance, you have been staying that swinging stomach you boasted of this morning. I remember then my little collation would have gone down with you without the sauce of a handsome face. Is your stomach so queasy now? Faith, long fasting child spoils a man's appetite. Yet, if you durst treat, I could so lay about me still. And would you fall too before a priest says grace? Oh, fie, fie! What an out-of-fashion thing hast thou named! Thou couldst not dash me more out of countenance, should thou show me an ugly face. Whilst he is seemingly courting Helena, enter Angelica, Moretta, Bisky, and Sebastian, all in masquerade. Angelica sees Wilmore and starts. Heavens, is he? And passionately fond to see another woman? What could you expect less from such a swaggerer? Expect? As much as I paid him a hard entire, which I had pride enough to think whene'er I gave, it would have raised the man above the vulgar, made him all soul and that all soft and constant. You see, Captain, how willing I am to be friends with you, till time and ill luck make us lovers. And ask you the question first, rather than put your modesty to the blush, by asking me. For alas, I know you captains are such strict men, severe observers of your vows to chastity, that twill be hard to prevail with your tender conscience to marry a young willing maid. Do not abuse me, for fear I should take thee at thy word and marry thee indeed, which I am sure will be revenge sufficient. A my conscience, that will be our destiny, because we are both of one humour. I am as inconstant as you. For I have considered, Captain, that a handsome woman has a great deal to do whilst her face is good, for then is our harvest time to gather friends. And should I in these days of my youth catch a fit of foolish constancy, I were undone. Tis loitering by daylight in our great journey. Therefore declare, I'll allow but one year for love, one year for indifference, and one year for hate. And then, Go hang yourself, for I profess myself the gay, the kind, and the unconstant. The devil's in't if this won't please you. 
Oh, most damnably. I have a heart with a hole quite through it, too. No prison like mine to keep a mistress in. Aside. Perjured man! How I believe thee now! Well, I see our business as well as humours are alike. Yours to cousin as many maids as will trust you, and I as many men as have faith. See if I have not as desperate a lying look, as you can have for the heart of you. Pulls off her wizard. He starts. How do you like it, Captain? Like it? By heaven! I never saw so much beauty. Oh, the charms of those sprightly black eyes, that strangely fair face, full of smiles and dimples, those soft round melting cherry lips, and small even white teeth, not to be expressed but silently adored. Oh, one look more, and strike me down, or, or I shall repeat nothing else till I am mad. He seems to court her to pull off her wizard. She refuses. I can endure no more, nor is it fit to interrupt him, for if I do, my jealousy has so destroyed my reason, I shall undo him. Therefore I'll retire. And you, Sebastian, follow that woman, and learn who tis. While you tell the fugitive, I would speak to him instantly. Exit. This while Florinda is talking to Belleville, who stands sullenly. Frederick courting Valeria. Prithee, dear stranger, be not so sullen, for though you have lost your love, you see my friend frankly offers you hers to play with in the meantime. Faith, madam, I, I am sorry I can't play at her game. Pray leave your intercession and mind your own affair. They will better agree apart. He is a model sire in a company. But alone, no woman escapes him. Sure, he does but rally. Yet if it should be true, I'll tempt him farther. Believe me, noble stranger, I'm no common mistress. And for a little proof, aunt, wear this jewel. Nay, take it, sir, tis right, and bills of exchange may sometimes miscarry. Madam, why am I chose out of all mankind to be the object of your bounty? Mm, there's another civil question asked. Box off's modesty. It spoils his own markets, and hinders mine. Sir, from my window I have often seen you, and women of quality have so few opportunities for love, that we ought to lose none. Aside to Belleville. Hey, this is something. Here's a woman. When shall I be blessed with so much kindness from your fair mouth? Take the jewel, fool. You tempt me strangely, madam. Every way. Aside. So, if I find him false, my whole repose is gone. And but for a vow I've made to a very fine lady, this goodness had subdued me. Fox, aren't be kind. In the pity to me be kind. For I am to thrive here but as you treat her friend. Tell me what you did in yonder house, and I'll unmask. Yonder house? Oh, I went to, uh, to, why, there's a friend of mine lives there. What? A she or a he friend? A man, upon my honour. A man? A she friend? No, no, madam. You have done my business. I thank you. And was your man friend that had more darts in his eyes than Cupid carries in a whole budget of arrows? So. Ah, such a bona roba! To be in her arms is lying in fresco, all perfumed air about me. Was this your man friend too? So. That gave you the he and the she gold that begets young pleasures. Well, well. Madam, then, you see, there are ladies in the world that will not be cruel. There are, madam, there are. And there be men, too, as fine, wild, inconstant fellows as yourself. There be, Captain, there be, if you go to that now. Therefore I'm resolved. Oh? To see your face no more. Oh? Till to-morrow. Egad, you frighted me. Nor then, neither, unless you'll swear never to see that lady more. See her? Why? Never to think of womankind again. Kneel, and swear. Kneels. She gives him her hand. I do. Never to think, to see, to love, nor lie with any but thyself. Kiss the book? Oh, most religiously. Kisses her hand. Now what a wicked creature am I, to damn a proper fellow. However, sir. I'll leave this with you, that when I'm gone, 
you may repent the opportunity you have lost by your modesty. Gives him the jewel which is her picture, and exits. He gazes after her. Twill be an age till tomorrow. Until then I will most impatiently expect you. Adieu, my dear pretty angel. Exeunt all the women. Ha! Florinda's picture. Twas she herself. What a dull dog was I. I would have given the world for one minute's discourse with her. This comes of your modesty. Ha! Box on your woe. Twas ten to one, but we had lost the dwell by it. Wilmore, the blessedest opportunity lost. Florinda, friends, Florinda! Ah, rogue! Such black eyes, such a face, such a mouth, such teeth, and so much wit. All, all, and a thousand charms besides. Why, dost thou know her? Know her? I, I, and a pox take me with all my heart for being modest. But hark ye, friend of mine, are you my rival? And have I been only beating the bush all this while? I, I understand thee not. I, I'm mad. See, here. Shows the picture. Ha! Ah, whose picture is this? Tis a fine wench. The colonel's mistress, sir. Oh, oh, here. I thought it had been another prize. Come, come, a bottle will set thee right again. Gives the picture back. I am content to try, and by that time twill be late enough for our design. Agreed. Love does all day the soul's great empire keep, but wine at night lulls the soft god asleep. Exeunt. Scene two. Lucetta's house. Enter Blunt and Lucetta with a light. Now we are safe and free. No fears of the coming home of my old jealous husband which made me a little thoughtful when you came in first. But now love is all the business of my soul. I am transported, pox hunt, that I had but some fine things to say to her, such as lovers use. I was a fool not to learn a Fred, a little by heart before I came. Something I must say. Sartlikens, sweet soul, I am not used to compliment, but I am an honest gentleman and thy humble servant. I have nothing to pay for so great a favour, but such a love as cannot but be great, since at first sight of that sweet face and shape it made me your absolute captive. Kind heart, how prettily she talks. Egad, I'll show her husband a Spanish trick. Send him out of the world and marry her. She's damnably in love with me, and will ne'er mind settlements. And so there's that said. Well, sir... I'll go and undress me and be with you instantly. Make haste then, for it's artlikens, dear soul. Thou canst not guess at the pain of a longin' lover, when his joys are drawn within the compass of a few minutes. You speak my sense, and I'll make haste to provide it. Exit. Tis a rare girl, and this one night's enjoyment with her will be worth all the days I ever passed in Essex. Would she go with me to England? though, to say truth, there's plenty of whores there already. But a pox on them, they are such mercenary prodigal whores that they want such a one as this that's free and generous to give them good examples. Why, what a house she has! How rich and fine! Enter Sancho. Sir, my lady has sent me to conduct you to her chamber. Sir, I shall be proud to follow. He is one of her servants, too. Sartlick, and by his garb and gravity, he, he might be a justice of the peace in Essex, and there's but a pimp here. Exeunt. The scene changes to a chamber with an alcove bed in it, a table, etc. Lucetta in bed. Enter Sancho and Blunt, who takes the candle of Sancho at the door. Sir, my commission reaches no further. Sir, I'll excuse your compliment. What, in bed, my sweet mistress? You see, I still outdo you in kindness. And thou shalt see what haste I'll make the quit scores. Oh, the luckiest rogue! Undresses himself. Should you be false or cruel now? False? Sartlikens, what doth that take me for a Jew? An insensible heathen? A pox of thy old jealous husband. And he were dead, he gad, sweet soul, 
It should be none of my fault if I did not marry thee. It never should be mine. Good soul, I am the fortunatest dog. Are you not undressed yet? As much as my impatience will permit. Goes towards the bed in his shirt and drawers. Hold, sir, put out the light. It might betray us else. Anything. I need no other light but that of thine eyes. Sartlikens. There, I think I add it. Puts out the candle. The bed descends. He gropes about to find it. Why? Why? Where am I got? What? Not yet? Where are you, sweetest? Ah, the rogue's silent now. A pretty love trick, this. Oh, she'll laugh at me anon. You need not, my dear rogue. You need not. I'm all on a fire already. Come, come, no call me in for pity. So I'm enchanted. I've been round the chamber and can find neither woman nor bed. I locked the door. I'm sure she cannot go that way. Or if she could, the bed could not. Enough, enough, my pretty wanton. Do not carry the jest too far. Ah, betrayed. Dogs, rogues, pimps. Help, help. Lights on a trap, and is let down. Enter Lucetta, Filippo, and Sancho with a light. <laughs> He's dispatched finely. Now, sir, had I been coy, we had missed of this booty. Nay, when I saw it was a substantial fool, I was mollified. But when you dote upon a serenading coxcomb, upon a face, fine clothes, and a lute, it makes me rage. You know I never was guilty of that folly, my dear Filippo, but with yourself. But come, let's see what we have got by this. A rich coat, sword and hat. These breeches, too, are well lined. Oh, see here a gold watch, a purse, ha, oh, gold, at least two hundred pistoles, a bunch of diamond rings, and one with the family arms, a gold box with a medal of his king, and his lady mother's picture. These were sacred relics, believe me. See the waistband of his breeches have a mine of gold. Old Queen Bess's. We have a quarrel to her ever since eighty-eight, and may therefore justify the theft. The Inquisition might have committed it. See a bracelet of bowed gold. These his sister tied about his arm at parting. But, well, for all this— I fear his being a stranger may make a noise, and hinder our trade with them hereafter. That's our security. He is not only a stranger to us, but to the country, too. The common shore into which he is descended, thou knowest, conducts him into another street, which this light will hinder him from ever finding again. He knows neither your name, nor the street where your house is, nay, nor the way to his own lodgings. And art not thou an unmerciful rogue? Not to afford him one night for all this? I should not have been such a Jew. Blame me not, Lucetta, to keep as much of thee as I can to myself. Come, that thought makes me wanton. Let's to bed. Sancho, lock up these. This is the fleece which fools do bear, designed for witty men to shear. Exeunt. The scene changes, and discovers Blunt creeping out of a common shore, his face, etc., all dirty. Oh, Lord! Climbing up. I am got out at last, and, which is a miracle, without a clue, and now to damning and cursing. But if that would ease me, where shall I begin? With my fortune, myself, or the queen that cozened me? What a dog was I to believe in women! Oh, coxcomb, ignorant, conceited coxcomb, to fancy she could be enamoured of my person, at the first sight enamoured. Oh, I am a cursed puppy, tis plain. Fool was written on my forehead, she perceived it, saw the Essex calf there. For what allurements could there be in this countenance, which I can endure, because I am acquainted with it? Oh, dull, silly dog, to be thus soothed into a cozening. 
Had I been drunk, I might fondly have credited the new queen, but as I was in my right wits, to be thus cheated, confirms I am a dull, believing English country fop. But my comrades, death and the devil, that's the worst of all. Then a ballad will be sung to-morrow on the Prado to a lousy tune of the enchanted squire and the annihilated damsel. But Fred, that rogue, and the colonel, will abuse me beyond all Christian patience. Had she left me my clothes, I have a bill of exchange at home, would have saved my credit. But now all I hope is taken from me. Well, I'll home, if I can find the way, with this consolation, though I am not the first kind believing coxcomb, but there are gallants, many such good natures amongst ye. And though you've better arts to hide your follies, that's heartlickens, you're all as errant cullies. Scene three, the garden in the night. Enter Florinda undressed with a key and a little box. Well, thus far I'm in my way to happiness. I have got myself free from Callis. My brother, too, I find by yonder light, is gone into his cabinet and thinks not of me. I have by good fortune got the key of the garden back door. I'll open it to prevent Belleville's knocking. A little noise will now alarm my brother. Now am I as fearful as a young thief. Unlocks the door. Hark! What noise is that? Oh, t'was the wind that played amongst the boughs. Belleville stays long, methinks. It's time. Stay, for fear of a surprise. I'll hide these jewels in yonder jessamine. She goes to lay down the box. Enter Wilmore, drunk. What the devil is become of these fellows Belleville and Frederick? They promised to stay at the next corner for me. But who the devil knows the corner of a full moon? Now, whereabouts am I? Ah, and what have we here? A garden. A very convenient place to sleep in. Ah, what has God sent us here? A female. By this light, a woman. I'm a dog, if it be not a very wench. He's come. Ha! Huh. Who's there? Sweet soul, let me salute thy shoestring. Tis not my Belleville. Good heavens, I know him not. Who are you, and from whence came you? Prithee, prithee, child, not so many hard questions. Let it suffice, I am here, child. Come, come kiss me. Good gods, what luck is mine? Only good luck, child, parlous good luck. Come hither. Tis a delicate, shining wench. By this hand she's perfumed and smells like any nosegay. Prithee, dear soul, let's not play the fool and lose time, precious time, for as gad shall save me, I'm as honest a fellow as breathes, though I am a little disguised at present. Come, I say, why thou mayst be free with me, I'll be very secret. I'll not boast who twas oblige me, not I. For hang me if I know thy name. Heavens! What a filthy beast is this! I am so, and thou oughtst the sooner to lie with me for that reason. For look, you child, there be no sin in it, because twas neither designed nor premeditated. Tis pure accident on both sides. That's a certain thing now. Indeed, should I make love to you, and you vow fidelity, and swear, and lie till you believed and yielded, thou art therefore, as thou art a good Christian, obliged in conscience to deny me nothing. Now, come, be kind, without any more idle prating. Oh, I am ruined! Wicked man, unhand me! Wicked? Gad, child, a judge were he young and vigorous, and saw those eyes of thine would know twas they gave the first blow, the first provocation. Come, prithee, let's lose no time, I say. This is a fine, convenient place. Sir, let me go, I conjure you, or I'll call out. Ay, ay, you were best to call witness to see how finely you treat me, do. I'll cry murder, rape, or anything, if you do not instantly let me go. A rape? Come, come, you lie, you 
baggage you like? What? I'll warrant you would fain have the world believe now that you are not so forward as I. No, no, not you. Why at this time of night was your cobweb door set open, dear spider, but to catch flies? Ah, come, or I shall be damnably angry. Why, what a coil is here? Sir, can you think? That you do it for nothing? Oh, oh, I find what you'd be at. Look, here's a pistol for you. Here's a work indeed. Here, take it, I say. For heaven's sake, sir, as you're a gentleman. So now she would be wheeling with me for more. What, you will not take it then? You're resolved you will not? Come, come, take it, or I'll put it up again. For look here, I never give more. Why, how now, mistress, are you so high of the mouth a pistol went down with you? Ha! Why, what a work's here! In good time come, no struggling, be gone. But an you good at dumb wrestle, I'm for ye. Look ye, I'm for ye. She struggles with him. Enter Belleville and Frederick. The door is open. Pox of this mad fellow. I'm angry that we've lost him. I durst have sworn he had followed us. But you are so hasty, Colonel, to be gone. Help! Help! Murder! Help! Oh, I'm ruined! Ha! Sure, that's Florinda's voice! Comes up to them. A man! Villain! Let go that lady! A noise. Wilmore turns and draws. Frederick interposes. Belleville! Heavens! My brother, too, is coming, and twill be impossible to escape. Belleville, I conjure you to walk under my chamber window, from whence I'll give you some instructions what to do. This rude man has undone us. Exit. Belleville! Enter Pedro, Stefano, and other servants with lights. I am betrayed. Run, Stefano, and see if Florinda be safe. Exit Stefano. They fight, and Pedro's party beats him out. Going out, meet Stefano. You need not, sir. The poor lady's fast asleep, and thinks no harm. I would not wake her, sir, for fear of frightening her with your danger. I'm glad she's there. Rascals, how came the garden door open? That question comes too late, sir. Some of my fellow servants masquerading, I'll warrant. Masquerading? A lewd custom to debauch our youth. There's something more in this than I imagine. Exeunt. Scene four. Changes to the street. Enter Belleville in a rage, Frederick holding him, and Wilmore melancholy. Why, how the devil should I know Florinda? A plague of your ignorance! If it had not been Florinda, must you be a beast? A, a brute? A, a senseless swine? Well, sir, you see, I'm endued with patience. I can bear, though, egad, you're very free with me, methinks. I was in good hopes the quarrel would have been on my side for so uncivilly interrupting me. Peace, brute! While thou art safe! Oh, I'm distracted! Nay, nay, I'm an unlucky dog, that's certain. A curse upon the star that ruled my birth! Or, or whatsoever other influence makes me still so wretched. Thou breakest my heart with these complaints. There is no star in fault, no influence but sack. The cursed sack I drank. Why, how the devil came you so drunk? Why, how the devil came you so sober? A curse upon his thin skull. He was always beforehand that way. Pretty, dear colonel, forgive him. He's sorry for his fault. He's always so after he's done a mischief. A plague on all such brutes. By this light I took her for an errant harlot. Damn your debauched opinion. Tell me, sot, hadst thou so much sense and light about thee to distinguish her to be a woman, and couldst thou not see something about her face and person to strike an awful reverence into thy soul? Faith, no. I considered her as mere a woman as I could wish. Steph, I have no patience. Draw, or I'll kill you. Let that alone till tomorrow, and if I set not all right again, use your pleasure. Tomorrow, damn it! The spiteful light will lead me to no happiness. Tomorrow is Antonio's, 
and perhaps guides him to my undoing. Oh, that I could meet this rival, this powerful fortunate. What then? Let thy own reason or my rage instruct thee. I shall be finely informed then, no doubt. H hear me, Colonel, hear me. Shew me the man, and I'll do his business. I know him no more than thou, or if I did, I should not need thy aid. This you say is Angelica's house? I promised the kind baggage to lie with her tonight. Offers to go in. Enter Antonio and his page. Antonio knocks on the hilt of his sword. You paid a thousand crowns, I directed. To the lady's old woman, sir, I did. Who the devil have we here? I'll now plant myself under Florinda's window, and if I find no comfort there, I'll, I'll die. Exeunt Belleville and Frederick. Enter Moretta. Page? Here's my lord. How is this? A pecaroon going to board my frigate? Here's one chase gun for you. Drawing his sword, jostles Antonio, who turns and draws. They fight. Antonio falls. Oh, bless us, we're all undone. Runs in and shuts the door. Help! Murder! Belleville returns at the noise of fighting. Ha! The mad rogue's engaged in some unlucky adventure again. Enter two or three masqueraders. Ha! A man killed! Oh, a man killed? Then I'll go home to sleep. Puts up and reels out. Exeunt masqueraders another way. Who should it be? Pray heaven the rogue is safe, for all my quarrel to him. As Belleville is groping about, enter an officer and six soldiers. Who's there? So here's one dispatched. Secure the murderer. Do not mistake my charity for murder. I, I came to his assistance. Soldiers seize on Belleville. That shall be tried, sir. St. Jago, swords drawn in the carnival time. Goes to Antonio. Thy hand, prithee. Ha, Don Antonio, look well to the villain there. How is it, sir? I am hurt. Has my humanity made me a criminal? Away with him. What a cursed chance is this? Exeunt soldiers with Belleville. This is the man that has set upon me twice. Carry him to my apartment till you have further orders for me. Exit Antonio, led. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Rover, Part One by Afra Ben. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene one, a fine room. Discovers Belleville as by dark alone. When shall I be weary of railing on fortune, who is resolved never to turn with smiles upon me? Two such defeats in one night. None but the devil and that mad rogue could have contrived to have plagued me with. I am here a prisoner. But where? Heaven knows. And if there be murder done, I can soon decide the fate of a stranger in a nation without mercy. Yes, this is nothing to the torture my soul bows with when I think of losing my fair, my dear Florinda. Hark! My door opens. A light. A man. And seems of quality. Armed, too. Oh, now I shall die like a dog without defense. Enter Antonio in a nightgown with a light his arm in a scarf and a sword under his arm. He sets the candle on the table. Sir, I come to know what injuries I have done you that could provoke you to so mean an action as to attack me basely without allowing time for my defence. Sir, for a man in my circumstances to plead innocence would look like fear, but view me well and you will find no marks of a coward on me, nor anything that betrays that brutality you accuse me of. In vain, sir, you impose upon my sense. You are not only he who drew on me last night, but yesterday before the same house, that of Angelica. Yet there is something in your face and mean. I own I fought today in the defence of a friend of mine, with whom you, if you're the same, and your party were first engaged. Perhaps you think this crime enough to kill me. But if you do, I cannot fear you'll do it basely. No, sir. 
I'll make you fit for a defence with this. Gives him the sword. This gallantry surprises me. No, nor know I how to use this present, sir, against a man so brave. You shall not need. For no, I come to snatch you from a danger that is decreed against you. Perhaps your life, or long imprisonment. And was with so much courage you offended, I cannot see you punished. How shall I pay this generosity? It had been safer to have killed another than have attempted me. To show your danger, sir, I let you know my quality. And tis the viceroy's son whom you have wounded. Aside. The viceroy's son! Death and confusion! Was this plague reserved to complete all the rest? Obliged by him, the man of all the world I would destroy. You seem disordered, sir. Yes, trust me, sir, I am. And tis with pain that man receives such bounties who wants the power to pay him back again. To gallant spirits this indeed uneasy. But you may quickly overpay me, sir. Aside. Oh, then I am well. Kind heaven. But set us even that I may fight with him and keep my honour safe. Oh, I am impatient, sir, to be discounting the mighty debt I owe you. You command me quickly. I have a quarrel with a rival, sir, about the maid we love. Aside. Oh, death! Tis Florinda he means. That thought destroys my reason, and I shall kill him. My rival, sir, is one has all the virtues man can boast of. Aside. Death! Who should this be? He challenged me to meet him on the mollow, as soon as day appeared. But last night's quarrel has made my arm unfit to guide a sword. I apprehend you, sir. You'd have me kill the man that lays a claim to the maid you speak of. I'll do it. I I'll fly to do it. Sir, do you know her? No, sir. But tis enough she is admired by you. Sir, I shall rob you of the glory on't, for you must fight under my name and dress. That opinion must be strangely obliging that makes you think I can personate the brave Antonio, whom I can but strive to imitate. You say too much to my advantage. Come, sir, the day appears that calls you forth. Within, sir, is the habit. Exit, Antonio. Fantastic fortune, thou deceitful light that cheats the wearied traveller by night, though on a precipice each step you tread, I am resolved to follow where you lead. Exit. Scene two. The Mallow. Enter Florinda and Callus in masks with Stefano. Aside. I'm dying with my fears. Belleville's not coming, as I expected, underneath my window, makes me believe that all those fears are true. Canst thou not tell with whom my brother fights? No, madam, they were both in masquerade. I was by when they challenged one another, and they had decided the quarrel then, but were prevented by some cavaliers, which made him put it off till now. But I am sure tis about you they fight. Aside. Nay, then tis with Belleville. For what other lover have I that dares fight for me, except Antonio? And he is too much in favour with my brother. If it be he, for whom shall I direct my prayers to heaven? Madam, I must leave you. For if my master see me, I shall be hanged for being your conductor. I escaped narrowly for the excuse I made for you last night i the garden. And I'll reward thee for it. Prithee no more. Exit Stefano. Enter Don Pedro in his masking habit. Antonio's late to-day. The place will fill, and we may be prevented. Walk about. Aside. Antonio! Sure I heard amiss. But who would not excuse a happy lover? when soft fair arms confine the yielding neck and the kind whisper languishingly breathes must you be gone so soon <laughs> sure i had dwelt for ever on her bosom but stay he's here enter belleville dressed in antonio's clothes tis not belleville half my fears are vanished antonio aside this must be he you're early, sir. I do not use to be outdone this way. The wretched, sir, are watchful, and tis enough you have the advantage of me in Angelica. Aside. Angelica? 
or I've mistook my man, or else Antonio, can he forget his interest in Florinda, and fight for common prize? Come, sir, you know our terms. By heaven, not I. No talking, I am ready, sir. Offers to fight. Florinda runs in. Oh, hold, whoe'er you be, I do conjure you, hold. If you strike here, I die. Florinda. Florinda imploring for my rival. Away. This kindness is unseasonable. Puts her by. They fight. She runs in just as Belleville disarms Pedro. Who are you, sir, that dare deny my prayers? Thy prayers destroy him. If thou wouldst preserve him, do that thou art unacquainted with and curse him. By all you hold most dear, by her you love, I do conjure you, touch him not. By her I love. See, I obey, and at your feet resign the useless trophy of my victory. Lays his sword at her feet. Antonio, you've done enough to prove you love Florinda. Love Florinda. Does heaven love adoration, prayer, or penitence? Love her. Here, sir, your sword again. Snatches up the sword and gives it to him. Upon this truth I'll fight my life away. No, you've redeemed my sister and my friendship. Don Pedro? He gives him Florinda and pulls off his vizard to show his face and puts it on again. Can you resign your claims to other women and give your heart entirely to Florinda? Entire, as dying saints' confessions are. I can delay my happiness no longer. This minute let me make Florinda mine. This minute let it be. No time so proper. This night my father will arrive from Rome, and possibly may hinder what we propose. Oh, heavens! This minute! Enter masqueraders and pass over. Oh, do not ruin me! The place begins to fill. And that we may not be observed, do you walk off to St. Peter's Church, where I will meet you and conclude your happiness. Aside. I'll meet you there. If there be no more saints' churches in Naples. Oh, stay, sir, and recall your hasty doom. Alas, I have not yet prepared my heart to entertain so strange a guest. Away! This silly modesty is assumed too late. Heaven, madam, what do you do? Do? Despise the man that lays a tyrant's claim to what he ought to conquer by submission. You do not know me. Move a little this way. Draws her aside. Yes, you may even force me to the altar, but not the holy man that offers there shall force me to be thine. Pedro talks to Callus this while. Oh, do not lose so blessed an opportunity. See? See, it is your Belleville, not Antonio, whom your mistaken scorn and anger ruins. Pulls off his vizard. Belleville? Where was my soul that could not meet thy voice and take this knowledge in? As they are talking, enter Wilmore, finely dressed, and Frederick. No intelligence? No news of Belleville yet? Well, I am the most unlucky rascal in nature. Ha! Huh. I am deceived, or is it he? Look, Fred, tis he, my dear Belleville. Runs and embraces him. Belleville's vizard falls out on his hand. Helen, confusion seize thee! Ha! Huh. Belleville. I beg your pardon, sir. Takes Florinda from him. Nay, cut her not. She's mine by conquest, sir. I, I won her by my sword. Didst thou so? And egad, child, will keep her by the sword. Draws on Pedro. Belleville goes between. Stand off! Thou art so profanely lewd, so cursed by heaven, all quarrels thou espousest must be fatal. Nay, an you be so hot, my valour's coy, and shall be courted when you want it next. Puts up his sword. To Pedro. You know I ought to claim a victor's right, but you're the brother to divine Florinda, to whom I'm such a slave. To purchase her I durst not hurt the man she holds so dear. "'Twas by Antonio's, not by Belleville's sword, this question should have been decided, sir. I must confess, much to your bravery's due, both now 
and when i met you last in arms but i am nicely punctual in my word as men of honour ought and beg your pardon for this mistake another time shall clear aside to florinda as they are going out this was some plot between you and belleville but i'll prevent you belleville looks after her and begins to walk up and down in a rage do not be modest now and lose the woman but if we fetch her back so do not speak to me not speak to you egad i'll speak to you and will be answered too will you sir i know i've done some mischief but i'm so dull a puppy that i'm the son of a whore if i know how or where pretty inform my understanding leave me i say and leave me instantly i will not leave you in this humour nor till i know my crime death i'll tell you sir draws and runs at wilmore he runs out belleville after him frederick interposes enter angelica moretta and sebastian ha sebastian is not that wilmore haste haste and bring him back the colonel's mad i never saw him thus before i will after him lest he do some mischief for I'm sure Wilmo will not draw on him. Exit. I am all rage. My first desire's defeated for one, for aught he knows, that has no other merit than her quality, her being Don Pedro's sister. He loves her, I know tis so. Dull, dull, insensible. He will not see me now, though oft invited, and broke his word last night. False, perjured man! he that but yesterday fought for my favours and would have made his life a sacrifice to have gained one night with me must now be hired and courted to my arms i told you what would come on but moretta's an old doting fool why did you give him five hundred crowns but to set yourself out for other lovers you should have kept him poor if you had meant to have any good for him oh name not such mean trifles had I given him all my youth has earned from sin, I had not lost a thought nor sigh upon't. But I have given him my eternal rest, my whole repose, my future joys, my heart, my virgin heart. Moretta, oh, tis gone! Curse on you, here he comes. How fine she has made him too. Enter Wilmore and Sebastian. Angelica turns and walks away. How now, turn shadow? Fly when I pursue and follow when i fly stay gentle shadow of my dove and tell me ere i go whether the substance may not prove a fleeting thing like you there's a soft kind look remaining yet as she turns she looks on him well sir you may be gay all happiness all joys pursue you still fortune's your slave and gives you every hour choice of new hearts and beauties till you are cloyed with the repeated bliss which others vainly languish for but know false man that i shall be revenged hmm. so gad there are of those faint-hearted lovers whom such a sharp lesson next their hearts would make as impotent as fourscore pox of this whining my business is to laugh and love a pox on it I hate your sullen lover. A man shall lose as much time to put you in a humour now as would serve to gain a new woman. I scorn to cool that fire I cannot raise, or do the drudgery of your virtuous mistress. A virtuous mistress? Death, what a thing hast thou found out for me! Why, what the devil should I do with a virtuous woman? A fort of ill-natured creatures that take a pride to torment a lover virtue is but an infirmity in women a disease that renders even the handsome ungrateful whilst the ill-favoured for want of solicitations and address only fancy themselves so i have lain with a woman of quality who has all the while been railing at whores i will not answer for your mistress's virtue though she be young enough to know no guilt and i could wish you would persuade my heart twas the two hundred thousand crowns you courted two hundred thousand crowns what story is this? What trick? What woman? Huh. How strange you make it. Have you forgot the creature you entertained on the piazza last night? Aside. Ha! My gypsy worth two hundred thousand crowns. Oh, how I long to be with her. Pox, I knew she was of quality. False man, I see my ruin in thy face. How many vows you breathed upon my bosom never to be unjust. Have you forgot so soon? Faith, no. I was just coming to repeat em. 
that here's a humour indeed would make a man a saint. Aside. Would she be angry enough to leave me and command me not to wait on her? Enter Helena, dressed in man's clothes. This must be Angelica. I know it by her mumping matron here. Ay, tis she. My mad captain's with her, too, for all his swearing. Oh, how this unconstant humour makes me love him! <sighs> Pray, good, grave gentlewoman, is not this Angelica? My too young sir, it is. I hope tis one from Don Antonio. Goes to Angelica. Aside. Well, something I'll do to vex him for this. I will not speak with him. Am I in humour to receive a lover? Not speak with him? Why? I'll be gone, and wait your idler minutes. Can I show less obedience to the thing I love so fondly? Offers to go. A fine excuse, this. Stay. And hinder your advantage? Should I repay your bounty so ungratefully? Come hither, boy, that I may let you see how much above the advantages you name I prize one minute's joy with you. Oh, you destroy me with this endearment. Death, how shall I get away? Madam... "'Twill be not fit I should be seen with you. "'Besides, it will not be convenient. "'And I've a friend that's dangerously sick. "'I see you're impatient, yet you shall stay.' "'Aside, and walks about impatiently. "'And miss my assignation with my gypsy. "'Moretta brings Helena, who addresses herself to Angelica. "'Madam, you'll hardly pardon my intrusion "'when you shall know my business.' and I'm too young to tell my tale with art. But there must be a wondrous store of goodness where so much beauty dwells. A pretty advocate, whoever sent thee. Prithee proceed. Nay, sir, you shall not go. To Wilmore, who is stealing off. Aside. Then I shall lose my gypsy for ever. Pox on it, she stays me out of spite. I am related to a lady, madam. Young, rich, and nobly born, but has the fate to be in love with a young English gentleman. Strangely she loves him. At first sight she loved him. But did adore him when she heard him speak. For he, she said, had charms in every word that failed not to surprise, to wound and conquer. Aside. Ah, egad, I hope this concerns me. Tis my false man he means. Would he were gone. This praise will raise his pride and ruin me. Well, since you are so impatient to be gone, I will release you, sir. Aside. Nay, then I'm sure twas me he spoke of. This cannot be the effects of kindness in her. No, madam, I've considered better on it, and will not give you cause of jealousy. But, sir, I've business that— This shall not do. I know tis but to try me. Well, to your story, boy, though twill undo me. With this addition to his other beauties— he won her unresisting, tender heart. He vowed and sighed and swore he loved her dearly. And she believed the cunning flatterer, and thought herself the happiest maid alive. Today was the appointed time by both to consummate their bliss. The virgin, altar, and the priest were dressed, and while she languished for the expected bridegroom, she heard he paid his broken vows to you. Aside. So this is some dear rogue that's in love with me, and this way lets me know it. Or, if it be not me, she means someone whose place I may supply. Now I perceive the cause of thy impatience to be gone, and all the business of this glorious dress. Damn the young praetor, I know not what he means. Madam, in your fair eyes I read too much concern to tell my farther business. Prithee, sweet youth, talk on. Thou mayst perhaps raise here a storm that may undo my passion, and then I'll grant thee anything. Madam, tis to entreat you. Oh, unreasonable! You would not see this stranger, for if you do she vows you are undone, though nature never made a man so excellent, and sure he'd have been a god but for inconstancy. Aside. Ah, rogue, how finely he's instructed. Is plain some woman that has seen me en passant. Oh, I shall burst with jealousy. Do you know the man you speak of? Yes, madam. He used to be in buff and scarlet. To Wilmore. 
Thou, false as hell, what canst thou say to this? By heaven. Hold, do not damn thyself. Nor hope to be believed. He walks about, they follow. O oh, perjured man, is't thus you pay my generous passion back? Why would you, sir, abuse my lady's faith? And use me so inhumanly? A maid so young, so innocent. Dost thou not know thy life is in my power? Or think my lady cannot be revenged? So, so, the storm comes finely on. Now thou art silent. Guilt has struck thee dumb. Oh, hadst thou still been so, I'd lived in safety. She turns away and weeps. Aside to Helena. Sweetheart, the lady's name in the house quickly. I'm impatient to be with her. Looks towards Angelica to watch her turning, and as she comes towards them he meets her. Aside. So now he is for another woman. The impudentest young thing in nature. I cannot persuade him out of his error, madam. I know he's in the right. Yet thou'st a tongue that would persuade him to deny his faith. In rage walks away. Her name, her name, dear boy. Have you forgot it, sir? Oh, I perceive he's not to know I am a stranger to his lady. Uh, yes, yes, I do know, but I have forgot the... By heaven, such early confidence I never saw. Did I not charge you with this mistress, sir, which you denied, though I beheld your perjury? This little generosity of thine has rendered back my heart. Walks away. So you have made sweet work here, my little mischief. Look, your lady be kind and good-natured now, or I shall have but a cursed bargain on it. Angelica turns towards them. The rogue's bred up to mischief. Art thou so great a fool to credit him? Yes, I do, and you in vain impose upon me. Come hither, boy. Is not this he you speak of? I think it is. I cannot swear, but I vow he is just another lying lover's look. Helena looks in his face. He gazes on her. Ha! Do I not know that face? <gasps> By heaven! My little gypsy! What a dull dog was I! Had I but looked that way, I'd known her. Are all my hopes of a new woman banished? Egad, if I don't fit thee for this, hang me. Madam, I have found out the plot. Oh, Lord, what does he say? Am I discovered now? Do you see this young spark here? He'll tell her who I am. Who do you think this is? Aye, aye, he does know me. Nay, dear captain, I'm undone if you discover me. Nay, nay, no cogging. She shall know what a precious mistress I have. Will you be such a devil? Nay, nay, I'll teach you to spoil sport you will not make. This small ambassador comes not from a person of quality, as you imagine, and he says, but from a very errant gypsy, the talkingest, pratingest, cantingest little animal thou ever sawst. What news you tell me? That's the thing I mean. Oh, would I were well off the place. If ever I go a-captain hunting again. Mean that thing? That gypsy thing? Thou mayest well as be jealous of thy monkey or parrot as her. A German motion were worth a dozen of her, and a dream were a better enjoyment, a creature of constitution fitter for heaven than man. Though I'm sure he lies, yet this vexes me. You are mistaken. She's a Spanish woman made up of no such dull materials. Materials? E gad, and she be made of any that will either dispense or admit of love, I'll be bound to countenance. Aside to him. Unreasonable man, do you think so? Did you not promise then to marry her? Not I, by heaven. You cannot undeceive my fears and torments till you have vowed you will not marry her. If he swears that, he'll be revenged on me indeed for all my rogueries. I know what arguments you'll bring against me, fortune and honour. Honour? I tell you I hate it in your sex, and those that fancy themselves possessed of that foppery are the most impertinently troublesome of all womankind, and will transgress nine commandments to keep one, and to satisfy your jealousy I swear— Aside to him. Oh no, swearing, dear captain. If it were possible I should ever be inclined to marry, it should be some kind young sinner, one that has generosity enough to give a favour handsomely to one that can ask it discreetly, one that has wit enough to manage an intrigue of love. Oh, how civil such a wench is to a man than does her the honour to marry her. By heaven, there's no faith in anything he says. Enter Sebastian. Madam, 
Don Antonio. Come hither. Ha! Oh, Antonio! He may be coming hither, and he'll certainly discover me. I'll therefore retire without a ceremony. Exit, Helena. I'll see him. Get my coach ready. It waits you, madam. What, madam? Now I may be gone and leave you to the enjoyment of my rival. Dull man, that canst not see how ill, how poor that false dissimulation looks. Be gone, and never let me see thy cousining face again, lest I relapse and kill thee. Yes, you can spare me now. Farewell till you are in a better humour. I'm glad of this release. Now for my gypsy. For though to worse we change, yet still we find new joys, new charms, in a new miss that's kind. Exit, Wilmore. He's gone, and in this ague of my soul the shivering fit returns. Oh, with what willing haste he took his leave, as if the longed-for minute were arrived of some blessed assignation. In vain I have consulted all my charms, in vain this beauty prized, in vain believed my eyes could kindle any lasting fires. I had forgot my name, my infamy, and the reproach that honour lays on those that dare pretend a sober passion here. Nice reputation, though it leave behind more virtues than inhabit where that dwells. Yet that once gone, those virtues shine no more. Then since I am not fit to be loved, I am resolved to think on a revenge on him that soothed me thus to my undoing. Exeunt. Scene three. A street. Enter Florinda and Valeria in habits different from what they have been seen in. Were happily escaped, yet I tremble still. A lover and fear. Why, I am but half a one, and yet I have courage for any attempt. Would Helena were here? I would fain have had her as deep in this mischief as we. She'll fear but ill else, I doubt. She pretended a visit to the Augustine nuns, but I believe some other design carried her out. Pray heavens we light on her. Prithee, what didst do with Callus? When I saw no reason would do good on her, I followed her into the wardrobe, and as she was looking for something in a green chest, I tumbled her in by the heels, snatched the key of the apartment where you were confined, locked her in, and left her bawling for help. Tis well you resolve to follow my fortunes, for thou darest never appear at home again after such an action. That's according as the young stranger and I shall agree. But to our business. I delivered your letter, your note, to Belleville, when I got out under pretense of going to Mass. I found him at his lodging, and believe me it came seasonably, for never was man in so desperate a condition. I told him of your resolution of making your escape to-day, if your brother would be absent long enough to permit you. If not, die rather than be Antonio's. Thou shouldst have told him I was confined to my chamber, upon my brother's suspicion, that the business on the molo was a plot laid between him and I. I said all this, and told him your brother was now gone to his devotion, and he resolves to visit every church till he find him, and not only undeceive him in that, but caress him so as shall delay his return home. Oh, heavens, he's here! and Belleville with him, too. They put on their visits. Enter Don Pedro, Belleville, Wilmore. Belleville and Don Pedro seeming in serious discourse. Walk boldly by them. I'll come at a distance, lest he suspect us. She walks by them and looks back on them. Ah, a woman, and of an excellent mien. She throws a kind look back at you. Death, tis a likely wench and that kind look shall not be cast away. I'll follow her. Prithee, do not! Do not? By heavens to the Antipodes with such an invitation. She goes out, and Wilmore follows her. Tis a mad fellow for a wench. Enter Frederick. Ho, oh, Colonel, such news. Prithee, what? News that will make you laugh in spite of fortune. What? Blunt has some damned trick put upon him. Cheated, banged, or clapped? Cheated, sir, rarely cheated of all his shirt and drawers. The unconscionable Hotu turned him out before consummation. So the traversing the streets at midnight, the watch found him in his fresco and conducted him home. By heaven, tis such a slight, and yet I durst as well have been hanged as laugh at him, or pity him. He beats all that do but ask him a question, and is in such an humour. Who is has met such ill usage, sir? 
a friend of ours whom you must see for mirth's sake aside i'll employ him to give florinda time for an escape who is he a, a young countryman of ours one that has been educated at so plentiful a rate he yet ne'er knew the want of money and twill be a great jest to see how simply he'll look without it for my part i'll lend him none and the rogue knows not how to put on a borrowing face and ask first i'll let him see how good tis to play our parts while i play his prithee fred uh, do go home and keep him in that posture till we come exeunt enter florinda from the farther end of the scene looking behind her i am followed still ha my brother too advancing this way good heavens defend me from being seen by him she goes off enter wilmore and after him valeria at a little distance ah there she sails she looks back as if she were willing to be boarded i'll warrant her prize he goes out valeria following enter helena just as he goes out with a page ha huh. is not that my captain that has a woman in chase tis not angelica boy follow those people at a distance and bring me an account where they go in i'll find his haunts and plague him everywhere oh my brother exit page belville wilmore pedro cross the stage helena runs off scene changes to another street enter florinda what shall i do my brother now pursues me will no kind power protect me from his tyranny ha ah, here's a door open i'll venture in since nothing can be worse than to fall into his hands my life and honour are at stake and my necessity has no choice she goes in enter valeria and helena's page peeping after florinda here she went in i shall remember this house exit boy this is belleville's lodgings she'd gone in as readily as if she knew it ha there's that mad fellow again i dare not venture in i'll watch my opportunity goes aside enter wilmore gazing about him i have lost her hereabouts pox on it she must not scape me so goes out scene changes to blunt's chamber discovers him sitting on a couch in his shirt and drawers reading so now my mind's a little a piece since i have resolved revenge a pox on this tailor though for not bringing home the clothes i bespoke and a pox of all poor cavaliers a man can never keep a spare suit for em and i shall have these rogues come in and find me naked and then i'm undone but i'm resolved to arm myself the rascal shall not insult over me too much puts on an old rusty sword and buff belt no how like a morris dancer i am equipped a fine lady-like whore to cheat me thus without affording me a kindness for my money a pox light on her i shall never be reconciled to the sex more she has made me as faithless as a physician as uncharitable as a churchman and as ill-natured as a poet oh how i'll use all womankind hereafter what would i give to have one of them within my reach now any mortal thing in petticoats kind fortune send me and i'll forgive thy last night's malice here's a cursed book too a warning to all young travellers that can instruct me how to prevent such mischiefs now tis too late well tis a rare convenient thing to read a little now and then as well as hawk and hunt sits down again and reads enter to him florinda this house is haunted sure tis well furnished and no living thing inhabits it oh, a man heavens how he's attired sure tis some rope dancer or fencing master i tremble now for fear and yet i must venture now to speak to him sir if i may not interrupt your meditations he starts up and gazes ha ah, what's here are uh, my wishes granted and is not that a she-creature that's hartlikens tis what wretched thing art thou ha ah. charitable sir you've told yourself already what i am a very wretched maid forced by a strange unlucky accident to seek a safety here and must be ruined if you do not grant it ruined is there any ruin so inevitable as that which now threatens thee dost thou know miserable woman into what debt of mischiefs thou art fallen what a bliss of confusion ah 
Dost not see something in my looks that frights thy guilty soul, and makes thee wish to change that shape of woman for any humble animal or devil? For those were safer for thee, and less mischievous. Alas, what mean you, sir? I must confess your looks have something in and makes me fear. But I beseech you, as you seem a gentleman, pity a harmless virgin that takes your house for sanctuary. Talk on, talk on, and weep, do, till my faith return. Do flatter me out of my senses again. A harmless virgin with a pox, as much one as t'other, as heart lickens. Why, what a devil can I not be safe in my house for you, not in my chamber? Nay, even being naked too cannot secure me. This is an impudence greater than has invaded me yet. Come, no resistance. Pulls her rudely. Dare you be so cruel? Cruel, as heartlickens as a galley slave or a Spanish whore. Cruel, yes, I will kiss and beat thee all over, kiss and see thee all over. Thou shalt lie with me too, not that I care for the enjoyment, but to let you see I have tamed a liberated malice to thee, and will be revenged on one whore for the sins of another. I will smile and deceive thee, flatter thee, and beat thee, kiss and swear, and lie to thee, embrace thee, and rob thee, as she did me, fawn on thee, and strip thee stark naked, then hang thee out my window by the heels, with a paper of scurvy verses fastened to thy breast, in praise of damnable women. Come, come along. Alas, sir, must I be sacrificed for the crimes of the most infamous of my sex? I never understood the sins you name. Do. Persuade the fool you love him, or that one of you can be just or honest. Tell me I was not an easy coxcomb, or any strange impossible tale. It will be believed sooner than I force showers or protestations. A generation of damned hypocrites, to flatter my very clothes from my back. Dissembling witches! Are these not the returns you make an honest gentleman that trusts, believes, and loves you? But if I not be even with you... Come along, and I shall. Pulls her again. Enter Frederick. Huh? What's here to do? That's hard lickens, Fred. I am glad thou art come to be a witness of my dire revenge. What's this? A person of quality too? Who is upon the ramble to supply the defects of some grave, impotent husband? No, this has another pretense. Some very unfortunate accident brought her hither to save a life pursued by I know not who or why. I'm forced to take sanctuary here at Fool's Haven. It's heartlickens to me of all mankind for protection. Is the ass to be cajoled again, think ye? No, young one, no prayers or tears shall mitigate my rage. Therefore prepare for both my pleasure of enjoyment and revenge, for I am resolved to make up my loss here upon thy body. I'll take it out in kindness and in beaten. No. Mistress of mine, what do you think of this? I think you will not, dares not be so barbarous. Have a care, Blunt. She'd fetched a deep sigh. She is enamoured with thy shirt and drawers. She will strip thee even of that. There are of her calling such unconscionable baggages, and such dexterous thieves. They will flee a man, and he shall never miss his skin till he feels the cold. There was a countryman of ours robbed of a row of teeth whilst he was sleeping which the jilt made him buy again when he waked. You see, lady, how little reason we have to trust you. Sad, Dickens. Why, this is most abominable. Some such devils there may be, but by all that's holy I am none such. I entered here to save a life in danger. For no goodness, I'll warrant her. Faith, damsel, you had even confessed the plain truth, for we are fellows not to be caught twice in the same trap. Look on that wreck. A tight vessel when we set out of heaven, well trimmed and laden, and see how a female picaron of this island of rogues has shattered him, and canst thou hope for any mercy? No, no, gentlewoman, come along, we must be better acquainted. We'll both lie with her, and then let me alone to bang her. I am ready to serve you in matters of revenge. That has a double pleasure in it. Well said. You hear, little one? How you are condemned by public vote to the bed within? There's no resisting your destiny, sweetheart. Pulls her. Stay, sir. 
I have seen you with Belleville, an English cavalier. For his sake, use me kindly. You know how, sir. Belleville? Why, yes, sweet ink. We do know Belleville, and wish he were here with us now. He's a comrade at Hoare and Beacon. He'll have a limb or two of thee, my virgin pullet. But tis no matter. We'll leave him the bones to pick. Sir, if you have any esteem for that Belleville, I conjure you to treat me with more gentleness. He'll thank you for the justice. Hark ye, Blunt. I doubt we are mistaken in this matter. Sir, if you find me not worth Belleville's care, use me as you please and that you may think I merit better treatment than you threaten. Pray, take this present. Gives him a ring. He looks on it. Hmm, a diamond. Why, tis a wonderful virtue now that lies in this ring, a mollifying virtue. Its heart like ends, there's more persuasive rhetoric in it than all her sex can utter. I begin to suspect something, and would anger us vilely to be truced up for a rape upon a maid of quality when we only believe we ruffle a hair lot. Thou art a credulous fellow, but as the Hartlikens, I have no faith yet. Why, my saint prattle as parlously as this does, she gave me a bracelet, too, a devil on her. But I sent my man to sell it to-day for necessaries, and it proved as counterfeit as her vows of love. However, let it reprieve her till we see Belleville. That's hard, yet I will grant it. Enter a servant. Oh, sir, the colonel's just come with his new friend, and a Spaniard of quality, and talks of having you to dinner with him. It's Hartlikens. I'm undone. I would not see him for the world. Hark ye, Fred, lock up the wench in your chamber. Fear nothing, madam. Whatever he threatens, you are safe whilst in my hands. Exeunt, Frederick and Florinda. And, sirrah, upon your life, see, I am not at home, or that I am asleep, or anything. Away. I'll prevent them coming this way. Locks the door and exeunt. End of Act 4《Act 5 of The Rover, Part 1, by Aphra Ben. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 1. Blunt's Chamber After a great knocking as at his chamber door, enter Blunt softly, crossing the stage in his shirt and drawers as before. Call within. Ned! Ned Blunt! Ned Blunt! The rogues are up in arms. As Hartlikens, this villainous Frederick has betrayed me. They have heard of my blessed fortune. Ned Blunt! Ned! Ned! And knocking within. Why, he's dead, sir! Without dispute dead, he has not been seen today. Let's break open the door. Here, boy! Ah! Break open the door. That mad fellow would be as good as his word. Boy, bring something to force the door. A great noise within at the door again. So now I must speak in my own defence. I'll try what rhetoric will do. Hold, hold. What do you mean, gentlemen? What do you mean? Oh, rogue! Art thou alive? Prithee open the door and convince us. Yes, I am alive, gentlemen, but at present a little busy. How? A blunt, grown a man of business? Come, come, open, and let's see this miracle. No, 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 gentlemen. Tis no great business, but... I am at my devotion. At Hartlikens, will you not allow a man time to pray? Turned religious! A greater wonder than the first! Therefore, open quickly, or we shall unhinge! We shall! This won't do. Why, hark ye, Colonel, to tell you the plain truth, I am about a necessary affair of life. I have a wench with me. You apprehend me? The devil's int, if they be so uncivil to disturb me, no. How? A wench? Nay, then, we must enter and partake. No resistance? Unless it be your lady of quality. And then we'll keep our distance. So, the business is out. Come, come, lend more hands to the door. Now heave together. So, well done, my boys. Breaks open the door. 
Enter Belleville, Wilmore, Frederick, Pedro, and Belleville's page. Blunt looks simply. They all laugh at him. He lays his hand on his sword and conies up to Wilmore. Hark ye, sir. Laugh out your laugh quickly. Do you hear? And be gone. I shall spoil your sport else. It's Hartlikens, sir. I shall. The jest has been carried on too long. A plague upon my tailor. It's death. How the whore has dressed him. Uh, faith, sir, I'm sorry. Are you so, sir? Keep to yourself, then. Sir, I advise you, do you hear? For I can as little endure your pity as his mirth. Lays his hand on his sword. Indeed, Wilmore, thou wert a little too rough with Ned Blunt's mistress. Call a person of quality whore, and when so young, so handsome, and so eloquent. Ha, ha, ha! Hark ye, sir, you know me, and know I can be angry, have a care. For at Satlikens I can fight too. I can, sir. Do you mark me? No more. Why so peevish, good Ned? There's some disappointments, I warrant. What? Did the jealous count her husband return just in the nick? Oh, the devil, sir. Do you laugh? They laugh. Look ye, settle me a good sober countenance, and that quickly do, or you shall know Ned Blunt is not. Not everybody, we know that. Not an ass to be laughed at, sir unconscionable sinner to bring a lover so near his happiness a vigorous passionate lover and then not only cheat him of his movables but his desires too ah sir a mistress is a trifle with blunt he'll have a dozen the next time he looks abroad his eyes have charms not to be resisted there needs no more than to expose that taking person to the view of the fair and he leads them all in triumph sir though i'm a stranger to you I'm ashamed at the rudeness of my nation, and could you learn who did it, would assist you to make an example of them. Why, ay, there's one speak sense now, and handsomely. Uh, let me tell you, gentlemen, I should not have showed myself like a jack puddin' thus to have made you mirth, but that I have revenge within my power. For no, I have got into my possession a female who had better have fallen under any curse than the ruin I design her. At Hartlikens, she has sought to be here in my own lodgings, and had doubtless committed a writ upon me, had not this sword defended me. I knew not that, but of my conscience thou hadst ravished her, had she not redeemed herself with a ring. Let's see it, Blunt. Blunt shows the ring. Ha! The ring I gave Florinda when we exchanged our vows! Hark ye, Blunt! Goes to whisper to him. No whispering. Good colonel, there's a woman in the case. No whispering. Hark ye, fool, be advised, and conceal both the ring and the story for your reputation's sake. Don't let people know what despised cullies we English are. To be cheated and abused by one whore, and another rather bribe thee than be kind to thee, is an infamy to our nation. Come, come, where's the wench? We'll see her. Let her be what she will. We'll see her. Aye, aye. Let us see her. I can soon discover whether she be of quality or for your diversion. She's in Fred's custody. Come, come, the key. To Frederick, who gives him the key. They are going. Death! What shall I do? Stay, gentlemen. Yet, if I hinder him, I shall discover all. Hold! Let's go on at once. Give me the key. Nay, hold there, Colonel. I'll go first. Nay, no dispute. Ned and I have the property of her. Damn property, then we'll draw cuts. Belleville goes to whisper to Wilmore. Nay, no corruption, good colonel. Come, the longest sword carries her. They all draw, forgetting Don Pedro being a Spaniard had the longest. I yield up my interests to you gentlemen, and that will be revenge sufficient. To Pedro. The wench is yours. Pox of his Toledo, I'd forgot that. Come, sir. I will conduct you to the lady. Exeunt Frederick and Pedro. Aside. To hinder him will certainly discover. Dost know, dull beast, what mischief thou hast done? Wilmore walking up and down out of humour. Aye, aye, to trust our fortune to lots. A devil on it, twas madness. That's the truth on it. Oh, intolerable sot! 
Enter Florinda, running masked, Pedro after her, Wilmore gazing round her. Aside. Good heaven, defend me from discovery. Tis but in vain to fly me. You are fallen to my lot. Sure, she is undiscovered yet, but now I feel there's no way to bring her off. Why, what a pox! Is not this my woman, the same I followed but now? Pedro talking to Florinda, who walks up and down. As if I did not know ye, and your business here. Aside. Good heaven! I fear he does indeed. Come, pray be kind. I know you meant to be so when you entered here, for these are proper gentlemen. But, sir, perhaps the lady will not be imposed upon. She'll choose her man. I am better bred than not to leave her choice free. Enter Valeria, who is surprised at the sight of Don Pedro. Aside. Don Pedro here. There's no avoiding him. Aside. Valeria, then I'm undone. Oh, I have found you, sir. To Pedro, running to him. The strangest accident, if I had breath, to tell it. Speak. Is Florinda safe? Helena well? Aye, aye, sir. Florinda is safe from any fears of you. Why? Where's Florinda? Speak. Aye, where indeed, sir. I wish I could inform you, but to hold you no longer in doubt. Aside. Oh, what will she say? She's fled away in the habit of one of her pages, sir. But Callis thinks you may retrieve her yet, if you make haste away. She'll tell you, sir, the rest, if you can find her out. Dishonourable girl. She has undone my aim, sir. You see my necessity of leaving you, and I hope you'll pardon it. My sister, I know, will make her flight to you, and if she do, I shall expect she should be rendered back. I shall consult my love and honour, sir. Exit Pedro. To Valeria. My dear preserver, let me embrace thee. Mystery by this light. Come, come, make haste and get yourselves married quickly, for your brother will return again. I am so surprised with fears and joys, so amazed to find you here in safety, I can scarce persuade my heart into a faith of what I see. Hark ye, Colonel, is this that mistress who has cost you so many sighs and me so many quarrels with you? It is. To Florinda. Uh, pray, give him the honour of your hand. Thus it must be received, then. Kneels and kisses her hand. And give your pardon, too? The friend to Belleville may command me anything. Aside. Death would I might, tis a surprising beauty. Boy, run and fetch a father instantly. Exit, boy. So, now do I stand like a dog, and have not a syllable to plead my own case with. By this hand, madam, I was never thoroughly confounded before nor shall i ever more dare look up with confidence till you are pleased to pardon me sir i'll be reconciled to you on one condition that you'll follow the example of your friend in marrying a maid that does not hate you and whose fortune i believe will not be unwelcome to you madam had i no inclinations that way i should obey your kind commands who fred mary he has so few inclinations for womankind that had he been possessed of paradise he might have continued there to this day if no crime but love could have disinherited him ho oh, i do not use to boast of my intrigues boast why that is nothing but boast and i dare swear wert thou as innocent from the sin of the grape as thou art from the apple thou mightst yet claim that right in eden which our first parents lost by too much loving i wish this lady would think me so modest a man she should be sorry then and not like you half so well and i should be loth to break my word with you which was that if your friend and mine are agreed it should be a match between you and i she gives him her hand bear witness colonel tis a bargain kisses her hand to florinda i have a pardon to beg to but it's at lickens i am so out of countenance that i am a dog if i can say anything to purpose sir i heartily forgive you all that's nobly said sweet lady belleville prithee present a, a, a ring again 
for I find I have not courage to approach him myself. Gives him the ring. He gives it to Florinda. Enter boy. Sir, I have brought the father that you sent for. Tis well. And now, my dear Florinda, let's fly to complete that mighty joy we have so long wished and sighed for. Come, Fred, you'll follow. Your example, sir, was ever my ambition in war, and must be so in love. And must not I see this juggling knot tied? No, thou shalt do us better service, and be our guard, lest Don Pedro's sudden return interrupt the ceremony. Content, I'll secure this pass. Exeunt Belleville, Florinda, Frederick, and Valeria. Sir, there's a lady without would speak to you. Conduct her in. I dare not quit my post. And, sir, your tailor waits you in your chamber. Some comfort yet. I shall not dance naked at the wedding. Exeunt Blunt and Boy. Enter again the boy, conducting in Angelica in a masking habit and a vizard. Wilmore runs to her. This can be none but my pretty gypsy. Ah, oh, I see you can follow as well as fly. Come, confess thyself the most malicious devil in nature. You think you have done my business with Angelica. Stand off, base villain. She draws a pistol and holds it to his breast. Ah, tis not she. Who art thou, and what's thy business? One thou hast injured, and who comes to kill thee for it. What the devil canst thou mean? By all my hopes to kill thee. Hold still the pistol to his breast, he going back, she following still. Prithee on what acquaintance, for I know thee not. Behold this face, so lost to thy remembrance, and then call all thy sins about thy soul, and let them die with thee. Pulls off her vizard. Angelica. Yes, traitor. Does not thy guilty blood run shivering through thy veins? Hast thou no horror at this sight, that tells thee thou hast not long to boast thy shameful conquest? Faith, no, child. My blood keeps its old ebbs and flows still, and that usual heat too, that could oblige thee with a kindness, had I but opportunity. Devil, dost wanton with my pain? Have at thy heart. Hold, dear Virago, hold thy hand a little. I am not now at leisure to be killed. Hold, and hear me. Aside. Death, I think she's in earnest. Aside, turning from him. Oh, if I take not heed, my coward heart will leave me to his mercy. What have you, sir, to say? But should I hear thee, thou'st talk away all that is brave about me. Follows him with the pistol to his breast. And I have vowed thy death by all that's sacred. Why, then there's an end of a proper handsome fellow that might have lived to have done good service yet. That's all I can say to it. Yet... I would give thee time for penitence. Faith, I thank God I have ever took care to lead a good, sober, hopeful life and am of a religion that teaches me to believe. I shall depart in peace. So will the devil. Tell me how many poor believing fools thou hast undone, how many hearts thou hast betrayed to ruin. Yet these are little mischiefs to the ills thou'st taught mine to commit. Thou'st taught it love. Egad was shrewdly hurt the while. Love, that has robbed it of its unconcern, of all that pride that taught me how to value it. And in its room a mean, submissive passion was conveyed, that made me humbly bow, which I ne'er did to anything but heaven. Thou, perjured man, didst this, and with thy oaths, which on thy knees thou didst devoutly make, softened my yielding heart. And then I was a slave, yet still had been content to have worn my chains, worn them with vanity and joy for ever, hadst thou not broke those vows that put them on. T'was then I was undone. All this while follows him with a pistol to his breast. Broke my vows? Why, where hast thou lived? Amongst the gods? For I never heard of mortal man that has not broke a thousand vows. Oh, impudence! Angelica, that beauty has been too long tempting not to have made a thousand lovers languish, who in the amorous favour no doubt have sworn like me. Did they all die in that faith, still adoring? I do not think they did. No, faithless man. Had I repaid their vows as I did thine, I would have killed the ungrateful that had abandoned me. This old general has quite spoiled thee. Nothing makes a woman so vain as being flattered. 
your old lover supplies the defects of age with intolerable dotage, vast charge, and that which you call constancy, and attributing all this to your own merits, you domineer and throw your favours in his teeth, upbraiding him still with the defects of age, and cuckold him as often as he deceives your expectations. But the gay, young, brisk lover that brings his equal fires and can give you dart for dart, he'll be as nice as you sometimes. All this thou'st made me know, for which I hate thee. Had I remained in innocent security, I should have thought all men were born my slaves, and worn my power like lightning in my eyes, to have destroyed at pleasure when offended. But when love held the mirror, the undeceiving glass reflected all the weakness of my soul, and made me know, my richest treasure being lost, my honour, all the remaining spoil could not be worth the conqueror's care or value. Oh, how I fell like a long-worshipped idol, discovering all the cheat! Would not the incense and rich sacrifice, which blind devotion offered at my altars, have fallen to thee? Why wouldst thou then destroy my fancied power? By heaven thou art brave, and I admire thee strangely. I wish I were that dull constant thing which thou wouldst have, and nature never meant me. I must, like cheerful birds, sing in all groves, and perch on every bough, billing the next kind she that flies to meet me. Yet, after all, I could build my nest with thee, thither repairing when I'd loved my round, and still reserve a tributary flame. To gain your credit, I'll pay you back your charity, and be obliged for nothing but for love. Offers her a purse of gold. Oh, that thou wert in earnest! So mean a thought of me would turn my rage to scorn, and I should pity thee, and give thee leave to live, which, for the public safety of our sex, and my own private injuries, I dare not do. Prepare. I will no more be tempted with replies. Follow still as before. Sure. Another word will damn thee. I've heard thee talk too long. She follows him with a pistol ready to shoot. He retires still amazed. Enter Don Antonio, his arm in a scarf, and lays hold on the pistol. Ha, Angelica. Antonio, what devil brought thee hither? Love and curiosity, seeing your coach at door. Let me disarm you of this unbecoming instrument of death. Takes away the pistol. Amongst the number of your slaves, was there not one worthy the honour to have forged your quarrel? Who are you, sir, that are so very wretched to marry death from her? One, sir, that could have made a better end of an amorous quarrel without you than with you. Sure, there's some rival. Ha! The very man took down her picture yesterday. The very same that sat on me last night. Blessed opportunity. Offers to shoot him. Hold, you're mistaken, sir. By heaven, the very same. Sir, what pretensions have you to this lady? Sir, I don't use to be examined, and am ill at all disputes, but this. Draws. Antonio offers to shoot. Oh, hold, you see he's armed with certain death. And you, Antonio, I command you, hold, by all the passion you've so lately vowed me. Enter Don Pedro, sees Antonio, and stays. Aside. Hmm. Huh. Antonio and Angelica. When I refuse obedience to your will, May you destroy me with your mortal hate. By all that's holy, I adore you so, that even my rival, who has charms enough to make him fall a victim to my jealousy, shall live, nay, and have leave to love on still. Aside. What's this I hear? Pointing to Wilmore. Ah, thus, twas thus he talked, and I believed. Antonio, yesterday... I'd not have sold my interest in his heart for all the sword has won and lost in battle. But now, to show my utmost of contempt, I give thee life, which if thou wouldst preserve, live where my eyes may never see thee more, live to undo someone whose soul may prove so bravely constant to revenge my love. Goes out. Antonio follows, but Pedro pulls him back. Antonio, stay. Don Pedro. What coward fear was that prevented thee from meeting me this morning on the molo meet thee yes me i was the man that dared thee to it hast thou so often seen me fight in war 
to find no better cause to excuse my absence. I sent my sword and one to do thee right, finding myself incapable to use the sword. But twas Florinda's quarrel that we fought, and you to show how little you esteemed her sent me your rival, giving him your interest. But I have found the cause of this affront. But when I meet you fit for the dispute, I'll tell you my resentment. I shall be ready, sir, ere long to do you reason. Exit, Antonio. If I could find Florinda now, whilst my anger's high, I think I should be kind and give her to Belleville in revenge. Faith, sir, I know not what you would do, but I believe the priest within has been so kind. How? My sister married? I hope by this time she is, and bedded too, for he has not my longings about him. Dares he do thus? Does he not fear my power? Faith, not at all. If you will go in and thank him for the favour he has done your sister, so. If not, sir, my power's greater in this house than yours. I have a damned surly crew here that will keep you till the next tide, and then clap you and board my prize. My ship lies but a league off the Molo, and we shall show your donship a damned Tramontana rover's trick. Enter Belleville. This rogue's in some new mischief. Ha! Pedro returned. Colonel Belleville, I hear that you have married my sister. You have heard truth then, sir. Have I so? Then, sir, I wish you joy. How? By this embrace I do, and I glad on Are you in earnest? By our long friendship and my obligations to thee I am. The sudden change I'll give you reasons for anon. Come, lead me into my sister, that she may know how I approve her choice. Exit Belleville with Pedro. Wilmore goes to follow them. Enter Helena as before in boy's clothes and pulls him back. Ah, my gypsy! Now a thousand blessings on thee for this kindness. Egad, child, I was e'en in despair of ever seeing thee again. My friends are all provided for within. Each man has his kind woman. Ha! Huh. I thought they had served me some such trick. And I was e'en resolved to go aboard, condemn myself to my lone cabin, and thoughts of thee. And could you have left me behind? Would you have been so ill-natured? Why, twould have broke my heart, child, but since we are met again, I defy foul weather to part us. And would you be a faithful friend now, if a maid should trust you? For a friend I cannot promise. Thou art of a form so excellent, a face and humour too good for cold, dull friendship. I am parlously afraid of being in love, child, and you have not forgot how severely you have used me. That's all one. Such usage you must still look for, to find out all your haunts, to rail at you to all that love you, till I have made you love only me in your own defence, because nobody else will love. But hast thou no better quality to recommend thyself by? Faith none, Captain. Why, twill be the greater charity to take me for thy mistress. I am a lone child, a kind of orphan lover. And why I should die a maid, and in a captain's hands, too, I do not understand. Egad, I was never clawed away with broadsides from any female before. Thou hast one virtue I adore, good nature. I hated coy demure mistress. She's as troublesome as a colt. I'll break none. No, give me a mad mistress when mewed, and in flying one I dare trust upon the wing that, whilst she's kind, will come to the lure. Nay, as kind as you will, good captain, whilst it lasts. But let's lose no time. My time's as precious to me as thine can be. Therefore, dear creature, since we are so well agreed, let's retire to my chamber. And if ever thou were treated with such savoury love, come, my bed's prepared for such a guest, all clean and sweet as thy fair self. I love to steal a dish and a bottle with a friend and hate long graces. Come. Let's retire and fall too. Tis but getting my consent, and the business is soon done. Let but old gaffer Hymen and his priest say amen to it, 
and I dare lay my mother's daughter by as proper a fellow as your father's son, without fear or blushing. Hold, hold, no bug-words, child, priest, and hymen. Prithee add hangman to him to make up the consort. No, no, we'll have no vows, but love, child, nor witness but the lover. The kind deity enjoins naught but love and enjoy. Hymen and priest wait still upon portion and jointure. Love and beauty have their own ceremonies. Marriage is as certain a bane to love as lending money is to friendship. I'll neither ask nor give a vow, though I could be content to turn gypsy and become a left-hand bridegroom to have the pleasure of working that great miracle of making a maid a mother, if you durst venture. Tis upsy-gypsy that, and if I miss, I'll lose my labour. And if you do not lose, what shall I get? A cradle full of noise and mischief, with a pack of repentance at my back? Can you teach me to weave inkle to pass my time with? Tis upsy-gypsy that too. I can teach thee to weave a true love not better. So can my dog. Well, I see we are both upon our guard, and I see there's no way to conquer good nature but by yielding. Here, give me thy hand. One kiss, and I am thine. One kiss. How like my page he speaks. I am resolved you shall have none for asking such a sneaking sum. He that will be satisfied with one kiss will never die of that longing. Good friend, single kiss, is all your talking come to this? A kiss, a caudle. Farewell, Captain Single Kiss. Nay, if we part so, let me die like a bird upon a bough at the sheriff's charge. By heaven, both the Indies shall not buy thee from me. I adore thy humour, and will marry thee. And we are so of one humour, it must be a bargain. Give me thy hand. Kisses her hand. And now that the blind ones love and fortune do their worst. Why, God a mercy, Captain. But hark ye, the bargain is now made. But is it not fit we should know each other's names? That when we have reason to curse one another hereafter, and people ask me who tis I give to the devil, I may at least be able to tell what family you came of. Good reason, Captain. And where I have cause, as I doubt not but I shall have plentiful, that I may know at whom to throw my blessings. I beseech ye your name. I am called Robert the Constant. A very fine name. Pray, was it your Faulkner or Butler that christened you? Do they not use to whistle when they call you? I hope you have a better that a man may name without crossing himself. You are so merry with mine. I am called Helena, the Inconstant. Enter Pedro, Belleville, Florinda, Frederick, Valeria. Ha! Huh. Helena! Helena! The very same? Ha! Huh, my brother! Now, Captain, show your love and courage. Stand to your arms and defend me bravely, or I am lost for ever. What's this I hear? False girl! How came you hither? And what's your business? Speak. Goes roughly to her. Hold off, sir. You have leave to parley only. Puts himself between. I had even as good tell it as you guess it. Faith, brother, my business is the same with all living creatures of my age, to love and be loved. And here's the man. Perfidious maid! Hast thou deceived me too? Deceived thyself and heaven? Tis time enough to make my peace with that. Be you but kind, let me alone with heaven. Belleville, I did not expect this false play from you. Was not enough you'd gain Florinda, which I pardoned? But your lewd friends too must be enriched with the spoils of a noble family. Faith, sir, I am as much surprised at this as you can be. Yet, sir, my friends are gentlemen, and ought to be esteemed for their misfortunes, since they have the glory to suffer with the best of men and kings. Tis true he's a rover of fortune, yet a prince aboard his little wooden world. What's this to the maintenance of a woman or her birth and quality? 
Faith, sir, I can boast of nothing but a sword which does me right where'er I come, and has defended a worse cause than a woman's. And since I loved her before I either knew her birth or name, I must pursue my resolution and marry her. And is all your holy intent of becoming a nun debauched into a desire of man? Why, I have considered the matter, brother, and find the three hundred thousand crowns my uncle left me, and you cannot keep from me, will be better laid out in love than in religion, and turn to as good an account. Let most voices carry it, for heaven or the captain. A, a captain! captain! A, a captain! captain! <laughs> Look ye, sir, tis a clear case. Aside. Oh, I am mad. If I refuse, my life's in danger. Come, there's one motive induces me. Take her. I shall now be free from the fear of her honour. Guard it you now, if you can. I have been a slave to it long enough. Gives her to him. Faith, sir, I am of a nation that are of opinion a woman's honour is not worth guarding when she has a mind to part with it. Well said, Captain. To Valeria. This was your plot, mistress, but I hope you have married one that will revenge my quarrel to you. There is no altering destiny, sir. Sooner than a woman's will, therefore I forgive you all. And I wish you may get my father's pardon as easily, which I fear. Enter Blunt, dressed in a Spanish habit, looking very ridiculously, his man adjusting his band. Tis very well, sir. Well, sir, as Artligans, I tell you, tis damnable ill, sir, a Spanish habit, good lord. Could the devil and my tailor devise no other punishment for me but the mode of a nation I abominate? What's the matter, Ned? Pray view me round and judge. Turns round. I must confess thou art a kind of an odd figure. In a Spanish habit with a vengeance. I had rather be in the Inquisition for Judaism than in this doublet and breeches. A pillory were an easy collar to this. Three handfuls I... And these shoes, too, are worse than the stocks, with the sole an inch shorter than my foot. In fine, gentlemen, methinks I look altogether like a bag of bays stuffed full of fool's flesh. Methinks tis well, and, and makes thee look on cavalier. Come, sir, settle your face, and salute our friends, lady. Ah, seest thou so, my little rover? To Helena. Lady. If you be one, give me leave to kiss your hand, and tell you, as heart thickens, for all I look so, I am your humble servant. A pox of my Spanish habit. Music is heard to play. Enter boy. Sir, as the custom is, the gay people in masquerade, who make every man's house their own, are coming up. Enter several men and women in masking habits with music. They put themselves in order and dance. At heart, Lickens, were it were lawful to pull off their false faces, that I might see if my doxy were not amongst them. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, since you are come so apropos, you must take a small collation with us. Whilst will to the good man within, who stays to give us a cast of his office. Have you no trembling at the near approach? No more than you have in an engagement or a tempest. He Gad, thou art a brave girl, and I admire thy love and courage. Lead on. No other dangers they can dread who venture in the storms of the marriage bed. Exeunt. Epilogue. The banished cavaliers, a roving blade, a popish carnival, a masquerade. The devil's in it, if this will please the nation. In these are blessed times of reformation when conventicling is so much in fashion. And yet, that mutinous tribe less factions do beget than your continual differing in wit, your judgments as your passions a disease, nor muse nor miss your appetite can please. You're grown as nice as queasy consciences, whose each convulsion, when the spirit moves, damns every thing that maggot disproves. With canting rule you would the stage refine, and to dull method all our sense confine, with insolence of commonwealths you rule, where each gay fop and politic brave fool on monarch wit impose without control. 
as for the last who seldom sees a play unless it be in the old blackfriars way shaking his empty noodle or bamboo he cries good faith these plays will never do ah sir in my young days what lofty wit what high strained scenes of fighting there were writ these are slight airy toys but tell me pray what has the house of commons done to-day then shows his politics to let you see of state affairs he'll judge as notably as he can do of wit and poetry the younger sparks who hither do resort cry pox on your gentle things give us more sport damn me i'm sure it will never please the court such fops are never pleased unless the play be stuffed with fools as brisk and dull as they such might the half-crown spare and in a glass at home behold a more accomplished ass where they may set their cravats wigs and faces and practise all their buffoonery grimaces see how this huff becomes this dammy flare which they at home may act because they dare but must with prudent caution do elsewhere oh that our noakes or tony lee could show a fop but half so much to the life as you End of Act Five. End of the Rover, Part One by Afra Ben.